Okay. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hi. Okay. Yes, good. Joining audio. Ah, uh, yes, he's not joining audio. Yeah. How's that? Oh, yeah, perfect. I'll I'll hang up the phone. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. I think we're good to go. Yep. Sounds good. Good. So, um, I might start to log on the next sort of five minutes or so. Um, we should have uh, we should have sort of uh, I think I think ten people joining us. Um, yep. One person registered at um, six thirty-five this evening, so obviously they split up with it. So, um, so we've got a few from last time and a few new faces as well. So, be quite, good. quite interesting. Yeah. So, what have you been up to today? I've uh, been, been at work. Um, I don't know if I told you before, but I work in training and recruitment uh, for a care company. Yeah. And so we look after young adults with um, severe low disabilities, things of that nature. And um, so um, the nice thing about COVID is we've, we've kept going throughout. We haven't closed or anything, which is yeah. Yeah. That routine that a lot of people have, have missed, really. Yeah. Um, it's quite a, I've been there almost nine years now, so it's quite a... Quite a nice yeah. job, but, um, yeah. but didn't get home to about sort of just up just before six, so a bit of a rush to have dinner and then get on. So <laughs> I um, don't look at my best. I do apologise. No, I, I think you look damned attractive in a funny sort of way. <laughs> I'm not sure. How to take that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, am I bright enough there? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. How am I? Am I a bit too bright? No, you're fine. You're good. It's difficult to. To know, I mean, ideally, I'd like the light off, really, but um, so no one can see me. <laughs> I think that'll be okay. So, um, so I've got the film ready now, and obviously, um, I don't know if you've got the Blu ray or the DVD copy, I don't know if they're slightly different or not. I think the Blu ray, I think I've got. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got, yeah. Because um, I think the Warner Brothers logo seems to sort of sweep in from the side. So I've sort of just got to where it's become flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I've done. So I've got it flat now. Perfect. Great. I'll tell everybody to do that when they uh, when they've logged on. Hmm. So, um, so they were just starting to drift in, were they? <clears throat> yeah, start drifting. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, imagine the boy doing doing what I was doing, sort of finishing off their tea and. Um, yeah. yeah. That, that sort of thing. So. so what's the running time? Do we know? Uh well the film is, is two hours. Um so okay. at seven o'clock just a sort of brief introduction and then we you know um give a few minutes just in case people need to get haven't got their equipment quite set up or if they've got one or two people running late. Um but we're sort of probably aim to start about five past seven, uh, yeah. run the film through. And then if there's any sort of wrap up that we any final comments uh, that you would like to make that we can can do that. There is no sense, you know, this, um, as, as long as you want. Oh, it, you've gone for me. You know, because yeah. I think I did the Superman 4 event recently, uh, two weeks ago, and despite the film being 90 minutes, we had it, it lasted three hours. Oh, so that's, I yeah. I was that, 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 that because we had. Um, uh, you know, special guest joining us halfway through, which is even I didn't even know about. So that was quite quite good. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, it depends on how fed up you get, really. <laughs> yeah, how tired you get after uh, running for three hours. I should think yeah. it's a long time. Yeah, well, obviously, if you need to come for breaks or anything, you know, just um, you know, just just say so. Okay, but you you also say if you want a break any time. I'm oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I will do. Um, I've got my um, a sad Superman fan, but I've got a Superman cup from Superman 4. <laughs> I've got a cup. Have Superman got cup, yes. Is it from number three or um, is it from. I think this is a general, general Superman cup with the, him on there and the, the logo. No, very nice, yeah. yeah. I had I had all I had the costume at one time. I had my costume, which I I threw away after a while, 
I and the last two things I had was the, the belt mm. uh, and the boots. Mm. And I remember throwing them away. I thought I'll never need these again. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Worth a fortune now. Yeah, they come up on auction so 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 rarely, and you know, there's lots of fakes out there and, and stuff. And uh, yeah, that, that's a bit of a mistake, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big mistake. Mm. Um, I don't think I've got anything left. I mean, I've got the little pins that they gave us, you know, sort of uh, worn uh, Superman bit pins. Mm. Um, but apart from that, I don't know. I'll have to go up in the loft and have a look. Mm. But I had uh, I had my full uh, alien suits when I did aliens, okay. um, and I had it for years. I had them in plastic bags, and when I moved a couple of times, just lost the lost the pipes on the back. I lost the tail. And all I had finished up with was the suit. Hmm. And uh, prop store wanted it. And they said, if I'd had the full suit, the one before, I mean, um, they'd sold one before for $150,000 in America. Right. So yeah, all I had was a little suit. I mean, the, the under suit. Yeah. But, you know, I've, I've got, you know, I've, Kept a few things like swords and um, shields and things like that from different movies. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, you know. Um, yeah, so I've, I've had quite a bit of um, many props I've had over the years. But you let them go, you don't bother with them. You know, it's, uh, you, don't, you never thought in those days that, uh, you know, there would be that much interest in it. Oh, no, 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 I don't think you would have done. I mean, um... I remember, remember going to conventions in the in the, the mid nineties, and they weren't what they are now. They were, you know, you, you paid whatever the ticket fee was, and you got access to people you, you wouldn't charge for autographs and all that sort of thing. And then suddenly, mm. in the two thousand, it sort of turned into this, and now it's almost like a little monster, really. Sort of, yeah, like, it's a full industry, you know, and it's good for you know for the old the actors that have been working on them, and um, I go to them, I love them. Um, I get to see all the guys that I've worked with over the years. It's the only time I get to see them. Oh, yeah. yeah. If we're away in, a, in you know, you go to France or like I've been to Mexico and to Canada, um, and then it's in the evening. You, it's great fun meeting all the fans, mm. but in the evenings is, is when you sit down and tell all the old stories of, um, yeah. you know, what it was like working on the movies. And So, yeah, you get to meet. That's what I like about it. It's a very social thing and you get to, to meet the guys that you haven't seen for years. Because hmm. it's not one of those, those jobs, is it, where you sort of work with the same people all the time. It's <laughs> no, no. Here here and they might never see them again, sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's good when we do get together, you know, hmm. at these the conventions or uh, like all the stunt guys, sometimes we get together for uh, lunch or something. But there's not many of us left now for the old school. Yeah, I mean, still, still a few, but but yeah, I know what you mean. It's a bit, um, um, you know, I mean, well, I saw 2021 on the calendar the other day, and I still think it sounds futuristic. You know, 2021 sounds something out of Blade Runner, doesn't it, really? So, um, yeah. it may have, because obviously Superman 3 is, is what, 30, um, no, uh, what was it, 80, 83? 83? So, 84, almost 40 years. Yeah, almost 40 years, yeah. Yeah. I think it was, um, yeah, it's amazing how a good time goes, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. So, my memory is going to be a bit, I, I'll, I'll have to catch up with them, seeing it again, maybe hopefully. I think that's must be the strange thing because the, the, the fans sort of know it back to front, and obviously, you know, then they come up and say to you, Do you remember this in scene 17, yeah. and 6? And you think, well, you don't remember it at all, you know. Yeah, I've been on conventions and people said, Oh, when you was in so and so, and I think, Was I in that? <laughs> I don't remember being actually on the movie, mm. but um, like all the old uh, Dracula films, I, I did a few of those. Mm. And uh, you know, you, you go in for a day or so and you do a little bit, and then off you go. It's just one job, in you know, maybe you've done six that week, <laughs> mm. yeah. You know, you used, used to do day jobs, you know, jobbing around. Hmm. So you do lots of um, lots of different movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
my um, um, ID, uh, IMDB is, hasn't got all the, the, the films that I've worked on. Mm. Uh, I come across, um, I was looking at old contracts as, you know, it's lots of films that um, I'd worked on and it's not on uh, IMDB. Mm. So, yeah, well. I think it's probably some films that perhaps you, you weren't on that I think you created. So I think you created, you only, you only have twice and I don't think you, no, no, I was around. I was doing them. I was like a, uh, helping out the, the stunts and um, uh, Bob Simmons. But um, so I, I was around, but I, I wouldn't consider myself, uh, you know, as uh, a stuntman on them or anything that would warrant me saying, yes, I did this on that movie. Hmm. I helped out shifting gear and, <laughs> and getting the stuntmen in positions. But uh, no, so. Okay. Yeah. That, that counts, you know, because because nowadays if people just got a hand and shot, they'll <laughs> see on the autograph circuit ten pounds of a signature, you know. So <laughs> and got just claim to, you know, to more than a lot of people do. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I was saying a, a man with golden gun. I think again you're crazy on that one, but I think you were saying again you were kind of just around rather than than on it. So um, which one? A man with golden gun. Yes. Yeah. No, I was around, but. Uh, no, I was never. Uh, I wasn't accepted as a the full time stunts then. Mm. So um, no, I didn't. Uh, I mean, yet you know, somehow they found out that I, I was around at them on those movies. Mm. So they credited me, but I would uh, hate to 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 take that credit. Mm. I'll try to get them off um, IMDb. I think I've got a couple off, but. Uh, there's stuff on there that, um, a bit of his early days, you know. Is there anything glaring on that's not on there that you would like to have on there? No, there's a, lots of uh, stuff I did second unit directing on that um, mm -hmm. I'm not credited with on the movie because, you know, uh, you go in as a um, stunt coordinator and then they say, can you do the second unit? And I never had an a a agent. So I get the extra money for doing the second unit, but when it, when they came to put the titles up, the director would prefer not to have a second unit, uh, anyone else directing his movie. Right. They um, try not to, to put second unit people on there. And if you haven't got an agent to fight for you, hmm. um, you tend to, to miss out. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's a few of those that uh, would have been nice to have got the credit for, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's, uh, I've got enough up there to to get by on. Yeah, you have indeed. Yes, yeah. I mean, do you do you find that that fans tend to come up to you about things like James Bond and Superman? Do you ever sort of get somebody that's interested in something that you, oh, this is um, not usual? Yeah, I was in Canada. I was doing a, um, a convention in Canada, and I um, and I put my photos up, and underneath the photos was. Um, just a side that they must have seen of Space 1999. I had some photos of Space 1999. Yeah. And they went berserk. I said, you did Space 1999? And yeah. I sold more Space 1999 than, than uh, Star Wars. Hmm. But um, yeah, they, it, it's what they were brought up on at the time. You hmm. know, it was all their youth, really. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so they were big fans of, of Space 1999 in the Canada. Mm. But you know, like uh, in, in France, uh, they, they loved um, uh, the Avengers. Uh, so yeah, they, you know, they, it depends where, you know, what those, what went out in their youth when they were like 14 or 15, 16, when they were, um, you know, watching these, uh, Serials, the ser you know, series, and they loved them. So, yeah, we all grew up, you know, with uh, different ideas of what was the fashion to watch at that time. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I think obviously I didn't see like the Avengers and Mount Munkle and all those sort of things at you know at the time, but I was quite blessed that they were be running that stuff when I was a kid on Channel Four and BBC Two and that sort of mm -hmm. things. So I, I did grow up with it you know in, in, in that way so um so what was your series that you were you thought you used to watch when he was younger i think point of man from uncle 
I think was a, a bit the biggest favourite. And, and I got to see Robert Vaughan perform in, in London in Club Angry Men a few years ago. And that was a real hype to see to see him and get his autograph. Uh, yeah, after. yeah. Um, Batman, the Adam West series, of course. Mm. Um, Boys of Bottom of the Sea. So David Heatherson connected to the Bonds there as well. Um, mm. I don't know, and sort of and I, and uh, Avengers and Doctor Who and, and things like that. So I'm kind of a fan of all of those, mm. uh, those shows. So um, I think I worked on the first Doctor Who with William oh. Hartnell. Oh, right, yeah. And then Patrick uh, thought Troughton, Patrick T Troughton. And then I did one a couple with, um, um, well, um, Pat, uh, who was the next one? Oh, John Patrick. John Perfrey, that's right, yeah. So yeah, I did stunts on that one. Uh, on the others, I was really a walk-on extra at BBC. Mm. Yeah. It's hard to think a lot of the Doctor Who's that you know, don't exist anymore, the particular Hart the Hartnells and the, the Troutons. Uh, yeah. No, they were black and white and they uh, probably uh, uh, taped over them. Yeah, because uh, I think videotape was expensive and storage was expensive, and they thought, well, he's going to be interested. And um, yeah, you know, you know it's, um, it's all changed a bit now, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just amazing. It's just digital. It's, uh, mm. it's amazing just what, what, they, what they can do now. Okay. And the cameras, you know, when, when I started, the cameras were like enormous Panas mm. uh, Panavision cameras. Now they're you know little little reds about this big. Mm. It's yeah. amazing technology. Oh yeah, definitely. Because what sort of things would you have grown up watching then? What what were your kind of things? Well, um, we didn't. Well, we had we had the first television in our street, so um, everyone used to come in and watch it. But for for me, it was uh, things like the Lone Ranger, oh, um, yeah. and um, uh, Buck Rogers of the 25th century, you know, um, all the old TV, like this black and white serials. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't think there was, there were shows that um, like the Four Just Men and things like that were a little later, but there wasn't too many, you know, that sort of serial that, um, I can remember thinking, well, you know, this is, you know, this is great. They were all okay, but yeah, nothing. But Lane, uh, the uh, Lone Ranger, I think, was was the one that um, stuck out in my mind. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't beat that theme tune, can you? And um, <laughs> no. so, I think so much of music is so crucial, isn't it? I think to people's yes, yeah, the love of, of shows or films. So. Um, um, you know, that's probably why the Avengers, the Man from Uncle, Batman, part of the success, I, I would imagine. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and, it, and some great music, you know. I mean, to be able to do all that incidental music as well, you know, it's not just the theme, it's, uh, it's putting the right music in the, in the quiet scenes and, <laughs> and what to do. I've been lo loving it, but they're watching, they're sh re showing the Avengers on in the afternoon or in the morning and then in the afternoon. Uh, so yeah, I've been watching those. Like today I saw myself in a fight with um, uh, the villains um, a couple of times, you know. Oh, so when we were doing them, they were, you know, everyone only had small screens mm. um, and, and not very good quality. <clears throat> um, and the stock wasn't all that great that we were using. And a couple of times I was doubling for Steed and I said to the director, you, you're a bit close on me here, you know, they're going to know it's me. He said, no, no, he said, who's going to know, you know, it's only a small screen. And But now with high definition, yeah. <laughs> you can see it's me. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. The times I go, oh my God, you know, obviously it's me. It's, <laughs> it can't be anybody else. <laughs> it's not Steed. <laughs> Well, you see so many booms and shadows and things that, again, you wouldn't see these days because they were thinking of oh, just a small screen. Yeah. Show wants to probably then be white. You yeah. Know? Partly it was, it was contract things as well, where they didn't want to pay people with repeat fees. So you should show them once or twice and then, and then they had, didn't want to have any more cost involved with it. So. Mm. 
we had, we had one lighting camera, a great old ca cameraman. He did all some big movies, um, but he used to say, "Just light the money." Yeah. He didn't worry about too much behind the set. You know, he, he would just pick out the, the actors, okay. light the light the money. So the girls looked beautiful, and Steve Steve always looked good. He would put a Charlie bar, which is in front of a light, okay. um, with just a thin shadow going across his neck so that he wouldn't show his double chin. <laughs> so he was, you know, he'd be beautiful close up. I, I could do with a couple of those bars. <laughs> yes. A couple of Charlie bars. <laughs> mm. Lockdown has not been good for people's diets, have they really? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, those were the days. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, do you prefer working in films? I mean, do you think it's lost anything now? In, in filmmaking, would you being so excited getting into career now rather than, than back then? Yeah, I would. Purely for wire work, I think the wire work they do these days is phenomenal. So yeah, I'd um, I'd like to to be able to when we started on you know trying to make a, a man fly. Mm. Um, as I say, we went down to eighteen gauge piano wire. It was a record from a piano. I mean. Yes. And that's when I had my accident. The, I was flying and yeah. the wires broke and I fell on my head. Um, so yeah, the, you know, now you can have, you know, you see actors being jumping around and, but they're on cables as thick as your thumb, you know, and they just wipe them out. Yeah. So, you know, there's not gonna be any um, wires breaking, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these days. If there are, there's something wrong. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll probably talk more about the, you know, the wire work and the, the technical side of, of the films uh, yeah. later on. But yeah, it's be interesting uh, yeah. avenue to go down. Um, yeah, we're getting quite a few people joining us now. But we're still a couple short, so it might just give them a couple of minutes to, uh, to, okay. to get in. Yeah, it's no problem. Um, so, so those that have have joined us, we're um, just going to give a few minutes more for a few more people to to join us. Um, in the meantime, just want to get your um, your, your copy of Superman 3 ready. We're all we're going to be pausing on the flat uh, Warner Bros. logo. So on the thing on the DVDs and the Blu-ray copies, the Warner Bros. logo sort of swoops in. So we're just waiting for it to go flat and then it says a, a Time Warner company. So we're all going to pause on that and then we'll have a once everybody's uh, joined, I just let's say a few words and then we'll um, do a little countdown and we'll we'll begin. So just a couple of minutes and then we'll then we'll get on. Yeah okay. Do you have to do anything with the sound or can you do that? Um, so with, with the sound, obviously, um, just we're obviously keeping for the, for the film, obviously keeping the sound off, obviously because yeah. of copyright yeah. issues and, and things. Um, if people want to ask any questions, they can go for the, the Q&A, there's a little chat feature, so any questions can pop up. Um, but other than that, we, we'll just be us sort of, sort of talking. Okay. how we're doing. Just give it two more minutes. Almost there. Have you done any of these um, sort of events before, Paul? On oh, I did a Zoom the other night to Canada, to, um, but that was just for a, for a podcast that he's putting out over Canada. So, um, yeah, but that, that was just a, just him and I, and it was just an interview, really. Oh, lovely, yeah. Mm. 
There seem to be quite a few people that are using Zoom as a format for, for similar things, yeah. but yeah. Um, surprisingly nobody's wanting to do any Superman or things like that. Which, um, mm. So um, I thought, why not? Absolutely. It keeps the lockdown man at bay, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, Paul, I might just go for a quick comfort break, just and then as soon as I get back, we'll. Um, okay. Okay. Yep. Fine. Okay. So um, I think there may be still a couple more people wait, uh, still to come, but we'll, we'll get started, and they can always always catch up. So um, so just to say, everybody that's already joined us, uh, welcome to Super and Free Watch Long event. Um, we're very privileged to have Paul Weston as our special guest um, for duration of the film. Um, so obviously, um, we're just obviously sharing recollections from the film as as and when we uh, we come to it, and obviously I'm going to. Um, put to Paul some questions that you guys have sent in as well and we'll just sort of uh, just to see how we go really. Um, so for those of you, I'm sure everybody knows um, about Paul's fantastic career uh, but if you don't his credits include um, numerous James Bond films, Indiana Jones, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, uh, the, the Avengers with Patrick Knee in the, in the 60s, uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, um, any more you want to add to that, Paul? Was that, was that a good good start? Star Wars. Good, good start. Yeah, Star Wars. Um, yeah, just just uh, films that I enjoy, like um, um, with uh, uh, Keith Sutherland and uh, Charlie Sheen, um, Three Musketeers. Which oh yeah, was great fun to to work on. Uh, yeah. A lot of swords and horses and fighting. It was good. But yeah, you know, those sort of films you, you tend to forget, but uh, that yeah, was, I know that, that one. There's a bit of a cash in to one who went to thieves, wasn't it? Very sort of similar. Yeah. I think you had the guy of Gisborne as the villain, didn't it, I think? So, right, yes. Yeah. A good film still, and it's, it's its own right. Mm. Um, okay, so we'll begin the, the watch along. So if we should be at the Warner Bros logo. So I'll do um, a, a quick countdown, and then we'll all press play. Um, mm. so everyone's ready. So... Five, four, three, two, one, and play. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's just starting. Hmm.
I suppose the, the first obvious starting point would be what's it like with, with having Richard Pryor as the as the co-star of a, of a Superman film. Yes. Yeah. Do you think yes. it was a good choice at the, at the time that Richard Pryor was coming in in such a big way? Yeah, it was a bit of a shock. We didn't realise who we were going to get, but um, it, uh, he was wonderful, lovely to work with. Um, he uh, he was great fun on the on the set, very funny, um, but very dedicated. I mean, he was uh, always there and knew his lines. So yeah, it was a it was a pleasure to work with. Okay, oh, and was he good at the? Um some of the, the action, like the wire work and that sort of thing? He was terrified. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about when we get closer to, to the end of it, but he, he hated heights. And he'd had a, a bad um, accident. And, and he tells the story, he was, he was doing some um, uh, crack cocaine and uh, spilt, spilt some rum on him, himself in a hotel room. It caught on fire and rushed out of the hotel on fire. So he burnt all his chest and his, his legs. So when it came to doing the, the wire work, we had to put him into a harness. Mm. Um, so we had some special um, underwear made for him. His, his skin was like tissue paper. So yeah, we had to be very careful with, uh, with him flying. But um, any work, we had a, a good stunt double for him, Greg Elan. Um, so yeah, he was. Uh, uh, we had to look after him, but he was. Uh, he was very good. Oh, good, good. Because yeah, it was quite. He was. Well, I think. I think everyone knows the story that he went on a, an American talk show and said how he loved to be in a Superman film, and I think that's how. <laughs> obviously, he really probably enjoyed the filmmaking process, particularly because he was a fan of the of the film, which uh, which always helps, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he was um, he was very good. Hmm. As I say, I eventually got him up on on wires for the last the, the end sequence, but um, before that, he, he didn't like heights at all. Hmm. So when we um, I was in the studio, we were doing a read through when we first started, and uh, uh, we had to find a high building for him to fall off, and I had to go to Calgary to find it. <laughs> Right. But, um, this was shot in Calgary um, with the beautiful um, uh, Pamela Stevenson. Mm. But all these guys are, it, this is a Richard uh, Lester's homage to asylum movies. Yes. Mm. yes. Um, so he's got all his friends that worked him, with him in London. Um, that, that guy was the only well, a Canadian guy I had for a stunt guy. He was my stunt coordinator out there. But all the guys you see walking around, um, I, like um, took Bob Todd and um, getting involved with the, these stupid <laughs> things. This is Graham Stark, uh, yeah. who, who's uh, Cluso's uh, <laughs> sergeant. Hmm. Um, so yeah, they brought them all out there and, um, and they had a great time. We had a great time, but it was only just, as the opening sequence, you know, it was the, the all cameos. And was it a budget decision to sort of not, not do it in New York or was it kind of made it easier to work? Oh, easier to work in, in Canada, yeah. This was Calgary, so it was a, um, a lot easier. You couldn't have got away with what we got away with uh, in New York. Hmm. And everyone loved Superman, so uh, we had you know, great support from uh, from the from the local police and uh, um, the government. Did you remember how long you were roughly working on the sequence for? Was it because um, obviously it's a quite complex? It was, yeah. It was, you know, a little um, vignettes, really. Um, but yeah, it was uh, probably a couple of weeks. We were out there, we, we did the rehearsal um, uh, with all my stunt guys first, and then we, we worked out the actual jokes um, when all the actors got there. This so is you'd, about, have, you'd have input into the, you know, the, like the jokes and things that we're. Yes, doing. yeah. It's Mark Boyle, and one of our stunt guys. Mm -hmm. um, was it the guy who came down the. Uh, yeah. By the bank, yeah. And this is Roy Allen, one of our great stunt guys. Uh, he's passed now, but uh, he was great. Overacting as always. 
Um, but this was a, a funny sequence. While we were doing that and the car was filling up, that's me on the left trying to get the open the doors and I actually pulled, broke yeah. one of the handles. Um, but a car pulled up behind us and out jumped an Asian guy, saw what was going on, grabbed one of the shovels and was going to smash the window. And I had to jump on him <laughs> and, and hold him back. He said, we've got to help, we've got to help. I said, it's all right, Superman's going to save him. <laughs> How he got through the, the cordon, I don't know. But um, we had to re redo it, fill it up again and, and reshoot it. Well, I think a lot of people would have just walked by, so it's quite nice that he did stop and, you know. So. Yes, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. He was a, a little hero, really, but um, he, Superman was going to be there anyway, so we knew that. <laughs> so Roy had a, a demand valve in there and air so that he could stay under there as long as uh, we wanted. Roy, Roy said to the director, um, do you want me to say something? He said, um, well, you can. He said, he said, if I start, he said, I won't stop. Because <laughs> he, could, he, could, he could tell a joke as well, Roy. It was funny. This is Bob Todd, one of our English actors uh -huh. from the old school. I had to be up there on the scaffold and drop it on his head, so I had to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you'd want to do too many takes of that, would you, really? <laughs> Take his nose off. Did this take a few takes, getting the pie in the... Yes, yeah. I imagine it would. We did have a, a question come in um, just about sort of um, what Pamela Stevenson was like to work with and how was her sort of um, comic timing, her technical timing, that, that sort of thing. How did she um, fare in the film? Yes, she was, she was not only beautiful, but she was very witty and um, she was great comedy timing because that's where she came from. She was, uh, you know, on not the nine o'clock news and all those sort of early um, TV uh, series with, um, um, with the uh, Beatle, uh, the um, Monty Python mob. So oh, she, yeah. She, yeah. she was very versed in, um, in uh, comic timing. She was great, but a lovely lady, yeah. And when I had to hang her up on the wall, which was, uh, <laughs> she, was she was a bit uh, uncomfortable for her, but she was, she was good. Oh, good, good, lovely. Yeah, that question came from, uh, from Jesse, so thank you for that one, Jesse. Thanks, Jeff. Because this obviously was a, a reuse of the, I think, the Superman 1, I think, that shot. Yes, yeah. That was New York. I done. I did a TV series with <clears throat> Robert the Protectors. Oh yeah, that's a good series. Yeah, I knew him very well. Later. <clears throat> How about working with people like uh, Jackie Cooper? Do you have your memories of? Lovely. Yeah, what an old pro. You know, really um, knew his stuff. Great timing. Comedy timing was great. And that's Annie Ross, who's a jazz singer. She was beautiful. I mean, a, a great jazz singer, but um, and a very, you know, attractive. But they made her look quite uh, uh, harsh <laughs> in this. But she was a lovely lady. Um, when they made the film Lenny, because she was uh, Lenny Bruce's girlfriend in the film Lenny, you know, the, the comedian. Yeah. Um, and when um, Dos, uh, Dustin Hoffman played him. He met her afterwards, and he, he said, "I, I," and he said, he, "She said she told me he started crying. He said I should have come and seen you. You know, I should have found you um, because she was with him for a few years." Uh, Lenny Bruce. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, this is uh, inside, obviously Pinewood Studios. Uh, the set that we smashed down a bit on uh, Superman 2. <laughs> so, so part of this would be, would be completely new, but some of it might have been sort of 
all this was new, but I mean, they had to rebuild it all, but it was the same setup. Hmm. Yeah. Same dressing. Um, and how do you feel about, about Margot Kidder having a, a reduced role in this film? Because I think she had some issues with the producers too. And yes, yeah, yeah. She, um, yeah, she obviously they they felt that she would she could do with a break, uh, but they still needed her. Um, yeah. So yeah, they they devised the story around her. Um, but between one and I think it was one and two, she had her teeth done. So and she looked entirely different when she came back. But uh, she was um, she was a really uh, feisty girl, but lovely, lovely. She was uh, really a nice person to work with, and especially when we were doing all the wire uh, the wire work and uh, in the early um, scene, uh, early movies. And we had to do, we had to work out the ballet sequence in, in the, you know, on wires when he takes her around the world and he's, and they do this dance in, in, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is, yeah, it was painful on wires, but uh, she did very well. I think it, so, so, so cool. It's Doug, is it? Who was the, um, who played Jimmy Olsen? Oh, uh, Mark McClure. Mark McClure, that's it. Yeah, I'm thinking of Doug McClure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Mark McClure, yeah. Mark, Mark, was, Mark was good to, to work with? Yes, yeah. He was lovely. He was he was happy all the time. He was like, um, I think he just enjoyed it being there. Um, on, you know, all the movies. But uh, it was good fun in Canada as well. I had to get him up on the uh, fire engine ladder. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I had Colin Skeep in Dublin for him. Oh, lovely, yeah. You've worked with Colin quite a few times, haven't you? On yes, yeah. He's a good performer. Hmm. I think it does make sense that um, they, they have a different sort of love interest in, in this film, because I suppose after one and two, and obviously, you know, you yeah. take it somewhere else. So I think, how can you take it, yeah. Yeah, so I think you need to probably rest the relationship a little bit and have somebody else come in. Mm. Um, because obviously if the producers just didn't want, want to use her because they were falling out, they wouldn't have got her back anyway, would they? So no. uh, it's probably more just almost written themselves into a corner with that relationship for now. And then mm. I think the idea was to come back in future films. Yes. Of course. Um. I met her again in in Rome. Um, I was on something else, and she was uh, she was there, so it was nice to to meet her up in the same hotel. And well, it, they were doing the um, the press junket, you know, where they, they go around selling the movie. And I was it happened to be in Rome at the time, and uh, met him up uh, up with them again. It was quite quite nice. Uh, well, which film was that? For? Sorry, was that? I think it must have been. Um, you what, what year would that have been? Um, yeah, I think it must have been this one, after this. Yeah. She still did the uh, press junket, I think. Oh, good. So there would have to be a good relationship or, you know, to sort of do that as well, yeah. Mm. But it's, it's uh, how believable is it that he's, you know, he's suddenly a, a, a computer genius? Mm. <laughs> I think, I think it's plausible enough in that there are people that can just, you know, pick, just pick it up very quickly and can sort of, you know, the, the way people's brains work, you know, like, um, you know, you know, t t t t technical people that just sort of can, can easily sort of... Yeah, have that sort of brain to be able to do it. Yeah. But whether computers could do all this stuff is another question, but I suppose back in the 80s, using computers as part of a, a yeah. movie probably fairly new really. Yes, yeah. So this was a great sequence for us for the stunt people. I had all my stunt people and I had um, um, Alex Green um, I got me some uh, Canadian stunt guys um, and we shot all the explosions in, in a um, oil refinery. Hmm. 
but uh, it, I think it all cut well together. Yeah. Was the refinery still in use, or was it sort of? Um, I think parts of it were. It was. Uh, we never got near, you know, anything that would would be, be uh, explosive. Um, but um, it looked good. We used it as, you know, the backdrop, and we built on on, you know, with that in the background, some some uh, buildings in front of it. Um, so that it looked as though, and then we, when uh, Jimmy Olsen goes up the ladder um, and he's looking at the oil refinery, we had to flip the camera on the other side and turned him round so he's looking at the same, the yeah. same one behind him. So it looked as though it was all round him, but in fact it's only one side. You can sort of just shoot it both ways and it sort of works. See, so all country. this was built and um, these are my stunt guys on top and girls. Colin Chilvers did all the um, uh, special effects. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and did a great job. And so did my, they were my stunt guys. Because obviously by now you had a con good continuity of, of, of people, probably most of them work on all three of the films. Yes, yeah. So we had a big crane there and you just, you know, take off. It's, it's great fun when, you, when you're actually flying like that, um, especially when you're up, you know, 50 feet in the air and you're going, you're flying around and you actually bank like a plane mm. you're going around in a circle. It's yeah, really good fun. Yeah. And now I had to grease this up because first they couldn't slide down it because it, it wasn't slippery enough and then we put too much grease on it and they came down too fast on top of each other. So we had to get it the, um, we had to wax it up just right. Hmm. So we could get them out, get them down fast, but still not on top of each other. Hmm. Some nice explosions, yep. got more guys near them. Did you, did you find you could do multiple takes on, on this sort of stuff or was it very much sort of one-off a lot of it? Um, not, not a lot of takes, a couple of takes um, from different angles if we needed it, but um, um, Richard Donner was pretty, uh, uh, Richard Lester, wash my mouth, because <laughs> Richard Lester, they didn't get on. Um, but uh, yeah, um, Richard, um, Lester is, is, was very economical. He, he would shoot what he needs to shoot. Uh, he knows exactly where he's going to cut. Um, he uses two or three cameras um, to get what he needs in, in one shot if he can. But uh, yeah, I've worked with uh, Richard Lester a few times and uh, it's very good to work with. He listens to you, um, you know, you can give him ideas. Do you want any, any miniatures on, on this or is it, more, is it all full scale like the tanker? No, that was miniature, I think. Those, uh, we got a few miniatures there that um, uh, Colin did. Mm -hmm. That's um, Colin's keeping doing the, the fall down, but he him for the drop in. Mm -hmm. And when we have um, Superman hearing uh, 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 Mark and, and he has to run through there. We had bars uh, of fire and as he stepped through one, we turned it down. So he stepped across the bar Then we brought it up behind him, shut the next one down. So he just walked through it, but there was flames on either side of him. Oh, It's always difficult landing when, when you've got, especially when you're carrying somebody, it's getting the timing right to put your feet down and um, Chris was very good at that. Hmm. There's a certain elegance, isn't there, of, of, of yes. Superman, particularly the, the landings and, uh, and stuff. And I, I remember when I was a kid playing Superman, trying to sort of get <laughs> the landings right and stuff. And I'm sure I've got a little knee injury as a result of that, actually. But uh, Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't think anybody sort of had that elegance when they play Superman. I think it was something unique to um, to Christopher Reeve. Yeah. It, it is, and you've got to work with the wire man. Bob uh, Harmon was a fantastic guy. Um, and it's the timing of um, of swinging me in and then just dropped it, just low it like, like that, just easing him into the ground, really. And it's up to Chris just to take his weight at the right time so that um, you don't get too much of a stumble. I remember on Superman one, I think it was. He's on when he's talking to uh, uh, Lois uh, on her in her apartment, and he turns and says, "He take after the ballet scene in the sky, he takes her around the world, and he says, "Good night, uh, don't, don't be put off flying." And one one take, he turned around, sort of waved at her, and then the escape pulled him along, but the wireman didn't lift him up. So he was, his toes were dragged along the floor. <laughs> and he's trying to be in his flying position. And he hit the, the low wall around the side and spun upside down. It was funny. He didn't think it was that funny, but it was, it was funny for us. So yeah, you, you just have to work with your wire man to make sure you get the, the right uh, um, weight. And as long as he can feel your weight, he can watch you. Sometimes he's watching on the monitor if he can't get on the set. And he's then having to judge it so that just to bring you down. And you need the rehearsals with the stunt man so that he gets a feel of it. And then when Chris comes in, uh, he gets a feel of it very quickly. So by this time, would, would you be still doubling for, for, for Chris? Or would, would you... Occasionally, I, but mainly I had, um, I had several uh, stunt guys because uh, literally I was too busy setting things up rather than uh, having to do it. Um, out there, I don't think, I think Chris did most of the flying out there. Um, it wasn't to the graveyard sequence um, that we had, that I took over for a little while and I had other people, but uh, things went, didn't go right. So I, I had to do it myself. So yeah, that's when we did, uh, I did both really, Superman and um, Clark Kent. That wasn't something that was originally it's going to be your, your team doing it rather than... No, not really. Hmm. But I'll talk you through that when we get there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, when we talk about the wild work, I did have a question uh, from, from a gentleman called Alex, and he wanted to know, um, because obviously you, you did allude to your accident on Superman 1, how, um, because of, w w what scene was it when you, your wire broke and, and what were the circumstances surrounding it? Oh yeah, I was, um, uh, it, it was funny enough, my birthday, January the 7th, if you want to send cards, but um, it's uh, January the 7th and they asked me to come in Saturday morning. I said, no, I'm not coming tomorrow, it's my birthday. They said, well, you'll be finished by uh, mid-afternoon. I said, okay, so I went in and I was re rehearsing the um, sequence where the um, burglar is and suckers and he's going up the side of the building mm -hmm. and then Superman lands and, and he tumbles back and uh, he falls into the, uh, then he flies after him. So we, uh, Saturday morning, we had the um, uh, side of the building on the floor. So the, 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 I was doing the uh, rehearsing for the um, burglar, but then I had suckers. So we lined all that up. Um, and then it was, uh, we were rehearsing the bit where Superman flies after him when he's, uh, so I was tumbling back for him and then I got into the costume and did the Superman bit. Um, so I was flying. Uh, um, when you're flying, you're on two wires onto your harness, as you know, onto a, like a, um, a coat hanger, two wires hanging from a coat hanger. That goes up to a skate that pulls you along the whole length of the studio. Mm. Well, I was uh, on that and we did rehearsals and I was flying and the skate was stopping maybe 15, 20 feet, well, 15 feet away from the big screen at the end. Um, so, but I had row of boxes all the way on the floor in case uh, anything happened. It was, uh, I was only probably 15 feet up in the air uh, at that point. Um, so 
I had a row of boxes with mattresses on all the way to the screen. Mm -hmm. And I was rehearsing and stopping. And when the skate stops, I pendulum on, on like, you know, just on the pendulum, just swung on the wires and came back. Um, so we said, okay, stand by. And Johnny May, the uh, uh, Sparks uh, gaffer said, Paul, can I take these two boxes out alongside the screen? I said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting anywhere near there. Uh, yeah, so he, he said, put, pushed the lamp around the other side and got, got the lamp to the other side. Turn, okay, let's do, go for one, action. So they pulled me, I don't know what they were thinking, the guys, because they're on a, the wire's on a big drum and the faster they spin the drum, the faster the skate goes. Hmm. They pulled me faster than I'd ever been before. And I flew along, the skate hit the stop. And then the wires swung on, I swung on like a pendulum, hit the screen and the wires broke or the wires broke and I hit the screen, I don't know. Uh, but I hit the screen and I must've got my hands down because um, I had my Superman watch, funny enough, under my costume. Uh, and uh, that cut my wrist, my back of my hand and both wrists went all the way back. Mm. And I hit, I must got my head, I was going down head first, hit my head, broke my cheekbone and sort of hit my hips and my knees. So I was at spark out and um, that was it. I, I remember sort of coming to on the floor, right where the boxes weren't. <laughs> um, and uh, then waking up in hospital. But um, yeah, my face was out here, but uh, that was it. That was my accident. It, the wires broke because they, we had them as thin as possible, you know, and then you put energy on it by, I was doing all the tumbling for the first for the um, uh, burglar and then flying. And like any flying, you know, take off and landing is the most dangerous um, mm -hmm. because as the skate goes away from you, it picks up your weight and then it pulls you. So all of the weight is on the wires at that point. When you get to the other end, your the skate stops and then you put the weight on the wires when it stops. So I think at that point, uh, the energy and the, the uh, it's like getting a piece of wire and bending it backwards and forwards and it gets hot and then it snaps. Yes. I think that's what, what that was the problem. After that, we realized that, you know, you can't have them that thin. So we had Bowden cable, which was like uh, six sort of little thin cables, but bound together. Hmm. So, yeah, that's, uh, that was my accident. So that put you, probably put you out of commission for quite a while, I'd, I'd imagine. Uh, no, it, well, it put me out. Um, I was, it was lovely of, uh, um, of Chris. Um, I, I was in hospital for a couple of days, that's all. And then I went home, um, but I was still sort of knocked up. So, and about a, three or four days later, my wife tells the story, she went down the hall to the, to the front door and there was this shape in front of it. There's an enormous shape, it was Chris Reeve. And um, he came in and uh, sat with me and uh, uh, it was very kind of him to come over to my house and uh, to, to see me. So when he had his accident, I sent him a letter saying, you know, I'm sorry, I can't be with you like you were with me. But uh, yeah, such a shame. Did you ever meet Chris post-accident or, or, or? Oh yeah, yeah. I went back, I mean, I, I went back onto it after that. Yes. Um, but uh, after we did uh, this one, mm -hmm. um, I went to see him, I was in New York and he was on, in a play on Broadway and uh, called uh, the uh, July the 5th and uh, where he played a paraplegic, a gay paraplegic. Um, and he, so I went to see him in that and um, he used to uh, get out of his chair in, in the play and then just sit back and he used to hit, sit on his bum um, and it used to shake the stage. And I said to him, Chris, you know, you can't keep doing that. It's going to do your spine. Um, he said, no, I you know, practice it and it's, it's okay. Um, and I have a sort of a, a theory. Chris was a, a great flyer. Um, he, when you put your arms out, uh, when you're flying, you're absolutely balanced right on your hips and you start to bend. You know, if you put your arms out forward, you go down. If you bring them back in, just bring them back a little, you'll come up again. Hmm. And he could get his, his head 
over the top of his arms. He could get his neck so far back that he was a better flyer than any of us. Mm -hmm. Because of that, he could get really look up at the camera. Yeah. I still have trouble with my neck now after all these years trying to get it back like that. And my theory is, which is possible, that when he had his accident, is the, when he went down, his head hit, and his, the flexibility in his neck was able to take it too far back. Mm. And it might have, you know, just snapped a bit further than would a normal person would go. I don't know. But um, I can imagine that's happening. Say sounds sounds possible, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, did, did you meet Chris after after you had his accident, or, or no? Or... Never got to see him again. No, which was a shame. Oh yeah, it's a huge huge shame, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is um, you know, I mean, it's special effects with the the ball, and uh, they fired it down there, and it's all uh, special effects. It's a nice, nice little moment, isn't it? Mm. Uh, what was the actor's name? Uh, oh, um, Kingsford G. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. Um, Someone will tell you. Can't quite remember. Yeah, he, I mean, he's. he's it's American, but he's been, he's lived, work, lived and worked here. I've worked with him so many times on, on uh, English movies when they want, uh, um, we used to call them Moody Yanks. Mm. They used to, um, you know, as long as they had an uh, uh, American accent, they'd get the job. Because <laughs> he did a Bond film, didn't he? I think it was Never Seen Ever Again, I think he appeared in that one. As, um, mm. the, the brother of... Um, uh, Dominic. Oh, Gavin O'Healy. Oh, oh, yeah. Gavin. And, um, and uh, one of the people watching Lee um, posted that, so thank you, Lee, for jogging our memory. Seriously, it's been a long time for me. Do you remember um, uh, Annette at all? Yes, yes. Very pleasant. Um, yeah, she was uh, just very nice. Good actress, you know, and she was, I mean, ideal, a good casting, really. The hometown girl, girl next door. I think what works so well with the Lana. Clark relationship is that she's in love with Clark, not not Superman. Yes, yeah. And I think we can all be in love with a with a superstar, a guy that can fly, mm. but to you know, yes, the sensitive guy in the corner isn't something that people always always do. So, yeah. and it was a childhood sweetheart, really. Yeah. We had some great sets. Uh, I think who was it who did the sets? Uh, I know. I, 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 uh, um, yeah, um, but um, uh, Peter Young was set dress decorator. Yeah. Peter, was it Peter Merton? Oh, oh, I'd have to have to double check. I, I know Peter Young was a set decorator on it. That I know for sure. Yeah. No, I think it was um, Peter Merton. If anybody knows, please um, post it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, some great sets and uh, dressing. Yeah, Jim uh, Jim says it, it was Peter Merton did, did yeah. It, and, and um, oh, yeah, also Peter Young, the, the set um, decorator. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Peter's just died. Oh, Peter, 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 yeah, because yeah. he did quite a few of the bonds, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, worked with him a lot. Hmm. Lovely man, very funny. And and Pete and uh, Peter Young, I think, also did to mine never dies and yeah, 
did have the opportunity to speak to, to, to Peter a while ago, and he's um, a, a, very nice, a very nice guy. Mm. And he's got a distinction, of course, of being one of the very few people that did all four Christopher Reeve films. Yeah. Mm. So it's much as well worth mentioning why you weren't involved with, with number four. Why I wasn't? Yeah. Um... I think I was away. I think uh, I was on something else. I know uh, Alf did it, Alf joint. Mm. Um, but um, I was really glad that I didn't do it, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was as good as it should have been. No, no. Um, so, yeah, I think <clears throat> I can't remember. Um, I was away on another movie, I think, when it was being set up. Yeah, it doesn't. They, I don't think they have the money to hire a lot of English crew anyway. So, I, you know, those people from the first three, obviously, you know, were a lot more expensive than the people that they ended up using. And so, um, mm. it's a shame they didn't have that technical expertise on on, on the film, really. Yeah. Did did they they sold it on to um, Globus and Golan? Yeah, Canon Films. Yeah. Canon yeah. Films. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big mistake. Yeah. And they were, yeah, they were the best producers. They were very cheap. Did you have any encounters with them? In, uh, in I did, I think, setting up something else. Um, I came across them uh, and here and in LA, um, but they didn't have a very good reputation. Mm. And they, they took over uh, Elsie Studios at one time, I think. Yes, they did, yeah. Um, so yeah, they weren't, uh, weren't the best. For our industry. You, you didn't do Supergirl, did you? No. no. No, I was around. I was doing something else. I was there at the studios working on something. Um, I think Alf did that one as well, Alf joined. Hmm. But um, yeah, I remember them being there. I was on another stage. Well, they were doing it when they built the whole set on the back lot at Pinewood. Because hmm. obviously, Chris Reeve, I think, was going to originally be in Supergirl, but hmm. the relationship with the producers was, was breaking down at that point. Is that something that you were aware of on the films, or was that kind of all? Oh, um, yeah, we knew it was going on. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, there was times when um, they were running out of money on Superman 2, I think. Mm. Uh, if not, yeah, and Superman too. Um, and people were banging on their doors for money and I had to have a couple of my stunt guys up by the accounts just in case somebody turned nasty. Oh, right. So they were really running out of money. They got it. I mean, it all came in and they paid people, but um, I think for a while there it was uh, touch and go. Mm. But they made it work and um, got through it. Is this also in Canada, this, this stuff? Yes, yeah. We was at, uh, I can't remember the town. Um, black, some black, black, no, it wasn't Black Horse. And this is a White Horse there, uh, close by, but I think it must have been just outside of Calgary. Hmm. Um, but it was oh. on, on the plains. Hmm. Uh, Jim has just said it was High River. High River, was it? Yeah. Thanks, Jim. It was quite funny. They, this was absolutely surreal, being out there. The colours were absolutely phenomenal. Hmm. Uh, of the yellow, of the yellow. I remember standing there when he flies towards us. Um, from the canvas, it was slightly on the side, but he was coming towards me. We had a crane hand, uh, arm out, and he was in the, in the uh, wheat fields. And on action, he came flying towards the camera uh, and to the towards the camera. So we had to have a 12 inch uh, crash mat uh, cut in front of the camera because it, uh, the, the crane, because he was crashing into it every time we had to come out, out of it and hit the, the uh, crash mat. Mm. But um, yeah, it was very good. But the colors of his red um, top and the, the blue sky was absolutely 
phenomenal with the yellow uh, wheat. It, yeah. it never came out as good as I remember standing there and looking at it. It's surreal. But they, they said they wanted a house that she lived in. So they looked all over and they found a house that looked run down and it looked just right. It was perfect for her house and her situation of, you know, being a working mum and, you know. Um, so they went to the people and said, can we rent your house? And they said, yes. So they did the deal. Um, and when they came back, they were so pleased the people that were having their house on, on, on the movie, they painted it beautiful, they cleaned it, they redecorated the whole house, which was, wasn't what they wanted. <laughs> they wanted it all dirty and you know a bit scrubby. But uh, I think they tried to dirty it down a bit, but uh, it's not it wasn't what they originally saw. Right. Which was, would have been perfect. You do hear similar stories of, of like. But it was that. great fun. Yeah, no, it was great to be in that sort of area of um, uh, just wheat fields and, and, and space. It was uh, big skies. It was really nice. Just a big country. <laughs> I mean, was it quite, I don't know if you, you might not know, but would it have been quite difficult to find a wheat field that would allow filming and that sort of thing? Would it no, you don't, you don't destroy that much. <clears throat> and they, they would have paid more, uh, got more out of it than um, uh, the little bit we damaged. Because hmm. <clears throat> we, yeah, to get out there, to get cameras out there. See, that was on a um, probably a uh, eighty foot crane, yeah. Just to get him flying off. This was a flying across the top, just amazing. Just had to make that was the superimposed one, but um, which I just had to be there standing by in case that guy <laughs> didn't stop in time. Because <clears throat> it was um, actually going. So you would have been um, able to sort of get that, just to yes, yeah, yeah. He would he, or something like that, or he would he was safe enough, but um, we just had to make sure that uh, everything was uh, safe for the kids. You know, you always have to be a little careful. Oh yeah, definitely. See the nice elegant landing there with the boy in his arms. And what, was the kid good to, to work with? Yeah, he, he was good. Um, it, you know, they, they love it, don't they? They love uh, kids, love make-believe, and uh, uh, they really get into it. Chris, when he first came to us, he was 24 years old. Uh, he, had, he had no definition on his body. Um, and he said, they said to him, right, well, we put a, a Batman suit on you, like uh, all the muscles underneath the costume. And he said, no, no, I want to do it myself. And for about five months, he trained with us uh, in the band room at Pinewood. And two hours in the morning, two hours at night, he would be there pumping up. Hmm. And at one stage, I think between uh, one and two, he, he got so big uh, for, in two, when we cut to number uh, to uh, some of the stuff that we used from one, you could see his neck go like that. Yeah. You know, he was like really solid at one time, he got too big. But um, uh, he, he worked at it and he became, you know, he became Superman shape and uh, that was all down to him and the dedication to, to look in the part.
Yeah, I think mean, he really, really looks very fit in this one particularly. Hmm. The best yeah. he was. When he did the um, burglar sequence and he lands uh, the lands in New York and catches the burglar, uh, that to shoot from a low angle to make him look big because he was still not, you know, he didn't have that great definition he, he managed to get later. Hmm. Because David Prowse was his, um, his, his trainer, wasn't he, on, on, on Superman? Do you, do you have, did you have much, much to do with David Prowse? Or? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, we, not then, but later on Star Wars, obviously. But um, uh, then he came in um, to train uh, Chris. But um, Chris felt that after a little while that he could do it himself. He didn't uh, need uh, Dave. So Dave left and uh, he carried on on his own. Hmm. And we used to do... It was our rehearsal room as well, the, the, the uh, gymnasium that we built. Um, so, yeah, we, we were up there doing wire work and testing, you know, so making sure he could fly um, straight correctly. Yeah. Um, and the first time he flew back to America, um, obviously no one particularly knew of him, but um, he was at Heathrow all the time we were telling him, Keep your arms straight, your head back, and um, you point your toes. You always got to point your toes, otherwise it doesn't look elegant. So every time he's on wires, that Chris, point your toes. So he'd point his toes. Uh, so he was at Heathrow, about to get onto the plane, and uh, <laughs> they had, it, had, had, it, had him paged. They said, uh, Christopher Reeve, Christopher Reeve, a message for Christopher Reeve, and don't forget to point your toes. <laughs> <laughs> He must have been quite embarrassed at that. Yeah, I imagine, yeah. <laughs> but he was a very talented guy. He could play, really play a piano very well. He he's could have, he's yeah. playing it in the early scene in, in, in Smallville. Yeah, he was, uh, he was really talented. Mm. I think Chris Weaver always said that he found Clark Kent quite easy to play because I think we all a bit insecure and a bit clumsy. Would you say that in between Superman and Clark Kent, where was Christopher Reeve in terms of as himself, if you like? Um, I think he was probably more Clark Kent. Hmm. Um, when he first came, he was very shy, um, you know, and <laughs> he was, you know, it was always with us at the boys and, and uh, on Superman 1. Um, we, I, we, I said to him one day, I said, um, you know, I said, once you get big, once your name's out there, because no one knows you at the moment, I said, but once you, this is going to be a success, you'll, you know, you'll go the other way, you'll, you'll get big headed. So he said, no, I won't, I'll never get big headed. I said, no, I will, we'll see, you know, power corrupts. He <laughs> just said, you know, it's winding him up, really. Um, and then um, on two, when he, started doing the second unit and uh, becoming you know having more power mm. um he um he became a bit you know a little up himself right and uh <laughs> we said uh he said to me one day he said what's the matter with, uh, with the crew he said they're not like they used to be we used to have some good fun and whatever i said well do you remember when i said to you <laughs> that you're gonna you know a bit of power changes people. She said, I'm not like that. I'm not, you know, I'm not. I said, well, you know, the crew just feel it. You know, you're not like you used to be. Because um, he was getting a bit, um, you know, demanding. Uh, not demanding, but saying what he wanted. And, you know, quite forthrightly, which he hadn't done before. So, um, but he changed. He said, yeah, okay. And um, he was back to normal. He never sort of, uh, I think he was aware of it more than anything else um and we and he was fine he was fine on this one um on three so i think he just for a little little while although he was doing he had much more power on this one but he didn't uh, use it like he he had at the you end of the guy um here at the, at the um the bank machine yeah he was on uh, superman 2 he was the copper copper yes uh, in uh, superman 2 He's also in the Spy Love Me as well, I think, in the one with submarines. That's right, yeah. I think um, 
I think he passed away quite a few years ago. Yeah. Sadly, I think. Yeah. Um, was he? Was what was? Do you, do you have any particular memories of him? Uh, no, only that he was. He was typical. What? Um, uh, Richard uh, Lester likes. Hmm. He was. He was almost like a Richard Lester. You could see Richard Lester uh, doing what he does. You know that nervous little bit, and uh, it's something that um, uh, he would he would appreciate Richard Lester. So that's why I used him so much. He was uh, he was good. He was, you know, leaning under the car and uh, being scared, and uh, hmm. so yeah, he was a, a typical Richard Lester actor, really. But a very nice man. Didn't have a lot of stunts to do with him, but. Uh, it was good. Would you be involved with this, with the, um, the traffic sequence? Uh, not, not particularly. Um, only, yeah, you've only in the car. It's not on organising that. All the, the assistants would not uh, organise all that. All we did was add drivers in and had a couple of crashes. That's all. Mm. The rest were just coming to a stop. And we took over the centre of um, Calgary, really. And how do you how do you feel that the film sort of, sort of holds up? Because I know people criticise this film probably because of being a bit too comedic, and perhaps the two traffic light men fighting perhaps is yeah, sort of... that's, yeah. I mean, so Richard Lester, hmm. um, yeah, just going over the top. Um, but you know, people say you know if you compare Richard Donner to Richard Lester, uh, how much better the um, two and three would have been. Uh, if Donna had uh, done them. Um, I, I've seen Donna's cut of Superman 1 and obviously he didn't have the material, but, um, uh, uh, so, sorry, of Superman 2 um, and using cuts from 1 and, and other stuff that he had uh, already shot. Yeah. Um, and I, don't, I didn't particularly think that was a, the, the greatest. He didn't have the material to work with. No, it wasn't film, was it, um, unfortunately? But he would have been more serious than um, uh, Lester, obviously. Hmm. And I think he would have uh, had more control over the script and what they did, and especially the, you know, the two men, the, hmm. the green and red fighting in the, in the uh, traffic lights would have gone. I don't think he would have had oh, that. Yeah. Have done that, no. but, 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 but I've just written, I'm, I'm writing the book and I'm going to quite a bit of detail about uh, on Superman 3 mm -hmm. because of, uh, uh, of this, the locations yeah. and the, the stuff we did. So uh, it's, it's um, I've just been remembering bits and pieces I've been writing down. So. Do you, do you know when roughly the book will be finished or published? Um, my first, the first part of it is finished, yeah. So I'm just waiting for, a, I get a, a publisher um, to get to get it printed and get it out there. And then I'm, I'm still, I'm working on a part two called Heroes and Villains. So um, as I shoot myself on a few occasions, <laughs> I played both many times. So this sequence here is um, they when we were having a uh, the first read through, uh, Dick Lester. We got to this point, and Dick Lester said, uh, "Paul, he said, you know, when you all sit around a table and you're all putting your bits in from different departments and you're reading the script, um, and they, you know, the art department said, yeah, we'll have the, the ski slope and everything will be there." Um, and Dick Donner said to me, he said, "Well, at this point, Paul, we'd like a bit of action." Mm -hmm. So I said, "Well, if." Um, if uh, Gus is, it gets excited telling the story about Superman saving the world and he puts on the skis and he's halfway up the slope and he gets excited and, and slips. And then if he went down the slope, crashed through the barrier and fell off the, the skyscraper, landed on a sloping roof and then off the sloping roof and into the road in uh, two cars coming up. Uh, he said, great, great, make it work. So now this was months before the, the movie, <laughs> before we started. So now I had to go to, I was on crutches at the time. I just broke my leg on um, uh, uh, 
Return of the Jedi. Um, so I was on crutches, went out to Calgary to look for the locations. And I found a building that we could use for the drop down, um, but I couldn't find a sloping roof that went left to right, uh, right to left, because on here we knew that he was going to go, uh, because of the setup, he was going to go off uh, right to left, and then he would have to fall right to left and land on the sloping roof and then go off into the, into the road. The only place I could find the sloping roof uh, was I could only shoot right to left. Uh, left yeah. and right. So um, I shot it and then they le left it to the editors to flip the film uh, when they got back to the studios so that he, he carried on uh, doing the fall and then sliding off uh, and uh, right to left. Hmm. So when we got out here and he was going to have to do this, I had Greg Elam, his stunt double, and uh, we found the building and we put the uh, descender on there like a cable that you can hang on and it just drops yeah. um, and it slows down towards the end but just in case from 300 feet I, um, you know in case anything went wrong with the wires I had a, a 40 foot uh, square uh, crash pad 20 feet high so you could do a high fall into that hmm. but hopefully you're never going to use it <laughs> so um, I took Greg up there and um, showed him what I wanted him to do um, and it's it's terrifying you know you, you're sitting on the edge of a, a 300 foot fall uh, with a cable and you hope that cable's gonna uh, <laughs> stop you hitting the ground but that I had to let, push him out on the on the skis and put the skis the, the lightweight skis on him get him out onto the edge and then let him drop down and you you drop just uh, maybe a foot to take up the slack yeah. and that will feel like a 50 foot fall just that drop uh, and I knew he's he, very brave uh, Greg and uh, but he was uh, he was a little uh, anyone would be a little apprehensive um, but yeah he did the, he did the fall we did a drop we had to try to line up the the cable with the building so we, we didn't see it which I think we we sort of achieved so uh, you'll see it in a minute. Uh, as I say, you know, it's, I had to come up with this idea once before and then make it work. And that's, that's your job really is uh, to give the director what he wants. But I think the, 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 even in those days, that um, effect was very good. The um, a little bit of um, CGI, <laughs> yeah, not CGI. Yeah. it's a, a match shot. Because even with all the, the technology they have, the, the newer Superman films, you don't, some of it is probably a bit more, more realistic, but, but you were saying about Superman flying over the weeks earlier. Yeah, yeah. They, don't, they wouldn't do that for real, so you don't get that look, you don't get that yeah, feel. No, it's true. You don't seem to get the sense of, um, the mass of the objects, if you, if you, if you know what I mean, it all seems yeah. a bit sort of I think people know these days, don't they? Hmm. They can uh, sense whether it's uh, set up. So that we did in the studio. This we did uh, in Calgary, but I had to go to a different location to do that, which was um, a restaurant. <laughs> I think it's a very impressive fall that, you know. Yes, say. yeah, it works. I mean, it's a, um, a descender job, which is, uh, you're usually pretty safe on those. But especially with the, uh, the, the glass reflecting, I, you couldn't CGI that out. So, no, no. So I suppose that was part of the technicality of setting it up. Yeah, and it, I think it works. Mm. Oh, very much so. I did have uh, one question from uh, Alex again. Um, Want to go back to Superman the, the movie, and obviously we talk about obviously your your injury on that, but obviously there was um, a very tragic uh, uh, um, event that happened where somebody was uh, crushed to death 
uh, when uh, Air Force One, the wing, um, killed somebody. Yeah, I did. Um, it was when I had my accident. It was uh, ten, just just gone ten o'clock in the morning. Hmm. At twenty past ten. Uh, at 10 past 10, the wires caught, I was on A stage, and the wires caught on a 30 foot tower, and it fell over, people jumped out the way. At 20 past 10, the same morning, up on 007 stage, uh, a 27 year old special effects guy was pulling up Air Force One wing, which weighed three tonne, mm. pulling up in position, on a rope, using a rope that had just come back from death on the Nile. They're, filming, they're just been filming out there and obviously it had dried out and as he was pulling it up it came down hit him killed and he went to the same hospital so the ambulance came and took him to west um uh what's it called uh, the, the hospital uh close by um and then the same host the same ambulance came back to pick me up 10 minutes later so it all happened on that morning, um, which is uh, a real tragedy. I mean, 27 years old, a young guy with uh, small kids, I think. Do you remember the gentleman's name? No, I don't. I don't. I, I probably did have it, but I can't, don't have it now. And I imagine that sent shockwaves to the whole film, I would have thought. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, it, well, it was a, yeah. It's a shock, but you know, with all accidents on films, is that you know, you did what do you do? Do you say, okay, we pack up, we're not going to work for two days or a week? Um, but normally, you you say, okay, no, we carry on. This is a tribute to them, you know, they give their life for this movie, we're not going to not do it. Um, so yeah, you usually carry on, it's usually the best thing to do. It's otherwise you'd you'd go mad, you know. You you would never make a movie again. Oh yeah, absolutely. You just have to uh, pick yourself up and uh, appreciate their work on it. Yeah. You know, could be any of you really when you're on a film set. Something goes wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. You're saying on Return of the Jedi, you um you break your leg, or was that on the the desert sequences, or it was. Uh, I was playing the skiff pilot on um, Badim. I was um, on with Billy Day, Billy D. Williams, Landau. The picture, um, that, the, the picture behind you is that from that scene. The um... uh, yes, yeah, that one. Yeah, that's the explosion that goes off, and um, I get, I get. I'm supposed to hang on to um, Billy D. Williams. Uh, yeah, to his double. Uh, Julius Lefleur. Um, I wanted to add two cables on, uh, but the stunt coordinator said no, just have one, just on uh, Julius. Um, and I said that's, that's you know we're putting a lot of weight on one harness and one one thing, but he insisted we do it. So I said okay. So on the explosion, it went off, and as we were normally, what we would have should have done is just got caught on the on the wire, swung back into the skiff itself, I hang on him and struggle for a bit and then drop the um, sort of 10 feet, 12 feet down onto the side of the Sarlacc pit, which was like a cone shape. Um, it was covered in foam. It was a scaffold with uh, uh, plywood all the way around and then covered in four inch foam uh, and then sand on the top of that. So then when you, um, the problem was is that the foam grabs you. It doesn't slide off your foot catch caught. So anyway, he, um, the explosion went off. We went off into, went to go in to do it fall off. And I felt a jerk on his body and the cable came away from his harness and I saw him, everything went in slow motion. And he grabbed the, the cable, which went through his hand and blood went Ting! in slow motion. I thought, shit, this is, uh, this shouldn't have happened. Yeah. And so now the two of us are falling, instead of me falling 12 feet, I'm falling 20 feet down with him on top of me. And my foot, my right foot hit first, and I uh, got caught in the, the foam, and with his weight just snapped my, fit, my foot and my leg. 
And as we were rolling into the Sarlacc pit, I thought I'd broken my leg. But if I can see my toes and they're pointing upwards, it's only one bone. If yes. it's facing the other way, it's both bones and that's bad. And I threw his body off me like that. And as we landed, uh, my foot came up and the toes were pointing upwards. I thought, oh, good, that's only one bone. And I was uh, a little pleased with that. Hmm. But yeah, that's when I that's when I broke my leg on uh, Return of Jedi. Hmm. But I've been very lucky over the years not having, you know, I used to do car knockdowns every night of the week on live stunt shows for two years. I'd go over, the, the car would drive at me, I'd go over the, the wing at one, uh, for one audience, one side, then it would turn around and come back, I'd go over the wing uh, for the other audience, then I'd it, go over the bonnet, hit the windscreen and bounce off. And then I'd be talking to the spieler, it's all a big show thing, and turn and see him coming towards me. And I'd one foot on the on the bonnet, and then another foot on the roof, and then do a funny run and run over the top of the car. Just so just timing, really. Um, and I used to do it every night of the week uh, for two years. But um, so yeah, I was lucky that I, I didn't do you know more damage to my body. Although it's up with me now. <laughs> Um, so, so this was obviously before you got into films and, and TV with the, the stunt shows. No, that was during. That was uh, 74, 75, the two seasons we did. Um, yeah, it was, wasn't much going on in the, in the film industry in England in the early 70s. So um, it was a way of making money, really. I'd never done a live stunt show before. So I used to jump car, uh, motorcycles over cars. Yeah. So, um, yeah. That's, uh, I just did that. Um, and it was a great learning curve, you know, for, for doing stunts. I really uh, learned a lot on that show. High falls, fire jobs, and motorcycles over cars. But I used to jump ramp to ground. So yes. I'd jump like 10, 15 cars, but I'd be going through the air like that because I, I, the ramp was so small, I'd hit. And it bounce, I'd bounce off because, you know, in 1974, there was no um, super sort of absorbance, uh, any um, uh, suspension. There was hardly no, any suspension. So I'd be hitting, like, be hitting the brick wall, bouncing up and then landing on the back wheel and the front wheel going down and used to pull my arms out of the sockets, just smashing down. Mm. So, yeah, those were the days. But a good learning curve. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was the house that they painted up nicely outside. It, it looks very, um, it does look like it's just had a, a fresh coat of paint. Uh, I did, I never noticed that before. But, um... Yeah, yeah. And you, I, went, I, I went there with them. I, I, you know, it was just right. It looked a little bit mold on the sides. All the white was just slightly off. It looked run down. But they were shocked when the art department went back and it was pristine. Hmm. To start of him there. Uh, so I don't like how they slightly changed the suit to make a bit washed out. And, yeah. Um, so this back, big back any memories of this, this stunt? Yeah, yeah, just... Um, I mean, it was down to uh, Colin to do all the setup, but I had the guys up there just in case. And then he pressed the button and away it all went. It was uh, just a nice location to, I mean, a good place to do it. And we got permission to do it, which is, you know, now you've got to clean all that up and take everything away, make sure there's no oil in the water. So you take out the engines and things like that. It's a, it was a big job, but Colin did a great job there. It looked perhaps a bit more simple than it, it probably was in terms of getting the, the guy off, getting the guy out the truck, making sure they didn't, you know, how do you get it so that you know the truck's not going to go over where you've got stunt the guy in the in the cabin and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, just um, just making sure that uh, they were all safe and no one was underneath. That was my job really to make sure. Mm. Uh, they were safe. This is John Boodle. 
But uh, again, um, one of uh, Richard Lester's favourites. The, the older gentleman. No, well, both of them. Uh, I can't remember the other. That's John, I think. Uh, one, with the, one with the statue in his hand. He was. Um, oh, he, he was Frank in uh, Vicar Dibley. Um, do you know the? Um, That's right. Yeah, you're right. I didn't know that until fairly recently, but now, of course, it's very obvious. Yeah. No, it may not be John Bootle then. Um, I'll have to look up the actor, but. Yeah, the other guy in the back is. Um, I can't think of his, his name either. But good old English actors, hmm. comedies. Do you have any particular memories of Robert Vaughan that stand out? And obviously working with the protectors and obviously this as, as well, because you were saying he was quite a nice guy too. Yeah, he was lovely. Yeah, really nice. Hmm. Um, I did, um, as I say, we did quite a bit of uh, action with him hmm. um, on the TV series. Uh, I remember his uh, stunt double, uh, Fred Haggerty, um, and we were doing doing a fight. And Fred said, well, "This is what you do." We re rehearsed it, and Fred was saying, "This is what you do, Robert." He said, "And you go there, and you go like, and you look up, and you go around, and then you, we go bang, bang, and dash." And Robert said, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. He said, "Fred, I may not quite do it like that because <laughs> <laughs> he was Fred was like all over the top." But uh, yeah, it was, it was funny and uh, he had a lovely wife. Um, his wife came out to uh, Malta with us. Mm -hmm. We had a wonderful time in Malta with um, Sylvia and um, um, Jerry Anderson. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. They were the producers. Mm. Yeah, it was a good little show, um, Protectors. Um, yes, yeah, it was uh, good fun. I doubled for Tony Ann Holt and uh, played parts and, you know, Shot myself at one time, so playing two parts. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put a moustache on, get up in the hills and shoot yourself. <laughs> I've just been shot down on the floor. Uh, and yeah, that's not something you tend to notice at the time, well, you know, seeing on television, but of course with the DVDs and everything, you can sort of, yeah. you know, the person that, I think maybe Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, at the end during the fight in, in the in the forest. I'm sure I've, I've watched it and, I've, and I've, I'm sure I've said, that didn't that guy die two minutes ago? Now he's up, up again, getting killed again, so. Uh, yeah. Mind you, I had, a, I, had a, I had four units going at one time hmm. to finish that. We were supposed to have, um, have six days on it. I think we, we took about uh, four weeks. Hmm. But uh, yeah. It was a, a big sequence, that was. And obviously with all the, the horses and everything, that's probably kind of why it took so long, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, you've got to train the horses, you've got to have good horsemen um, to do all that stuff. Um, but Kevin uh, was a good uh, horseman anyway. Hmm. But I went over to, um, to train him for Prince of Thieves. I went to his house in Pasadena and uh, taught him uh, archery and uh, sword fencing. Uh, so we'd go, I'd go there at, um, I had him from 7.30 in the morning till 9.30, mm. because he was editing Dances with Wolves. Oh yeah, yeah. So I went to his house and uh, with uh, Terry Walsh, my uh, sword guy, and um, we'd go there, have a, have a cup of coffee with him and the kids would come out, he had to, to, to get a boy and a girl. And um, he would show us, uh, he's what well, he's editing um, on the on the the, the uh, video uh, of what he's editing, and then uh, we say, "Come on, we've got to get out and do a bit of work." <laughs> so we get out there, and um, I'd, I'd have planks on the floor, so he had to jump from rock to rock for the um, fight with uh, Little John in the uh, yeah, in the water. Um, so yeah, so I'd get him going through the staff fight and then we we put up he had a nice bank at the back and we put some targets up and he did some um archery uh and sword fight so yeah he was, but i only had him for, until 9 30 and he had to go over to the studios to continue editing dances oh it's very impressive given the amount of work he had to, had to yes do. yeah we did we had, had longer once he was here uh in england but uh, this was before we started the movie 
just to get him into it. I had to do the same with Charlie, Charlie Sheen and um, Keith Sutherland and uh, Chris McDonnell, Ollie Platt. I had to go to LA to get them on horses, um, see how they rode, um, see how the, you know, the sword fighting. I had Bob Anderson with me doing the swords, which was oh, yeah. brilliant. Um, so yeah, and I said to, I couldn't get Charlie, every time I called Charlie to come to um, uh, uh, the uh, horse um, riding uh, place we had just outside, where was it? But, um, anyway, uh, he, he wouldn't come. I, uh, so the others had turned up, and I said to I said to um, Keith and Sullivan, I said, "What's you know? You've done the long knives, are they long coats or something with a, a cowboy thing with uh, uh, Charlie Sheen? What's he like on a horse?" And Keith has said, "Charlie Sheen rides a mean stepladder." <laughs> I used to put a stepladder up in between the horses so the guys would be on the horses and he'd be sitting on the stepladder for the close-ups and I had a good double for him anyway um, so um, I, you know he didn't have to do too much hmm. I loved his style he was a I got on well with Charlie okay good I mean, touching on Prince of Thieves, just, just one more time, you're saying that it took four weeks to shoot that, that battle was partly because you had lots of fire effects and obviously you didn't want to take down the forest with it. Was that difficult to sort of manage that kind of part of it? Yes, yeah, I think it took even longer than that. But um, I said, because we got the storyboards and we got the script, uh, I got it from Kevin Reynolds, the director. I'd worked with a couple of times on movies. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely man. Um, and I said, we got six days to do this, Kevin. And he said, yeah. <laughs> I think we took about getting on for six weeks to do that sequence. There was a hell of a lot of work in it. I mean, there was a lot of um, stuff to do. And, you know, apart from the, the stunts, uh, as I say, at one time, we had, I had four units going, which wow. meant doubling up on horses, doubling up on men. Um, doing close-ups of firework on, on one side and, uh, you know, so, yeah, it was um, a tough, tough shoot. In, in January, in January, in the, in the woods, so it was, didn't have a lot of uh, light. Hmm. I, th I think you didn't, I think when you spoke to me last time, I think you said you were responsible for one of the, probably the best shots in, in the film when the, Robin and Marion are up in one of the little. Um, ah yes, in in the uh, the treasure, yeah. the treasure house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they were up about thirty feet, and in the script, um, she climbs up there, and uh, he goes up there, and she's in there, and she gives him the, the dagger, um, mm -hmm. and then they they come out, and she's supposed to get down the ladder. And I said to him, it's very difficult to, to either you let the girl go down first or you go down behind her, then you're looking up a skirt, which is, you know, not very nice. I said, look, what if I came up with this little idea of uh, Azim has, has got this counterbalance thing and there's a rope with a loop in it and you put your foot in it and you, you put your arm around her uh, and step off and then the counterbalance weight takes them down and they spin slowly around. It's a more intimate shot, oh, yeah. completely. So I, and I think it worked. Um, he was very pleased with it, um, Kevin. So yeah, it was a great shot, oh, yeah. and it was intimate. Hmm. So again, how, how would, have, um, would, it be, would you shot this particular? Um, yeah, they, they built the side of the, um, the, the, contain, the, the ship hmm. and this was all lead. Um, and uh, he was able just to bend it up, and then they, and Colin pumped it out from the inside. So, um, yeah, that was just a big, big flat really with um, that part that was just made of lead. So Chris is is down the floor, and then it sort of flipped, is it? Or no, no, it was upright. And it was with, wires again. For that. Yeah, it was on. He was on on wires, mm -hmm. but um, he was. It, he was able just to put his arm in and pull them out. So uh, uh, pull out the, the lead. 
mm. and then just spurt it out the colin edit on pumps it was fairly simple to do it's it when he went back he had to you know bend it all back again and uh, put it in so that had to be redone Doesn't she look gorgeous? She's a yeah, yeah. very pretty girl. Mm. Married to um, Billy Connolly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's a, a psychiatrist. Mm. A psychologist, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think she did many, many films that as far as I'm aware. Um... No, I don't know. I think uh, Jim pointed out earlier that the guy, the, the boy who, who played Ricky, I think that was his only, this was his only film credit as well. So he didn't go on to do other. Oh, really? Apparently. Yeah. Yeah, you wonder what happened to them, didn't you? When you see them on film, you think, well, you know, did where did they go from there? <laughs> yeah, there's some people just, I know the, the Bond girl curse being quite a famous one, the, the Bond ladies, you see them in one film and, that they don't ever, I mean, nowadays that they seem to make a you know, much more successful career wise, but a lot of people, specifically back in the 60s, 70s, and saw them once in a big film and they seem to sort of disappear. Yeah. Oh, um, Jim said that the guy who plays Ricky, a gentleman called Paul, he, um, uh, I'm just to put the comment in the way. Um, yeah, but apparently the guy who plays Ricky is called Paul and he's an engineer in Calgary. Oh, <laughs> right. Amazing. Yeah. That little fight was my stunt guys and we just worked out a funny thing with him getting stuck in the door and hmm. um, and we had a couple of, you know, just crashed a couple of cars. I wasn't out there when they did this bit. So it didn't affect me, I don't think. So you didn't go to the Grand Canyon at any, at any time? I've been there a few times, but uh, no, not, not for this, no. It's quite impressive that they went out to do what is a very small sequence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what are your memories of um, the producers, either Solkind and Pierre Spengler? Uh, they did a they did a great job in getting the, the money for the movie. Um, once they they obviously got the rights to it, um, they then had to make it work, and um, uh, it I think became a bigger project than they were prepared for, and that's why I think you know it. Uh, they got a great cast and, um, you know, with Gene Hackman. And, uh, so, you know, you were, it, it was a, a big movie and I th think they did a great job eventually. And it's a shame that um, they didn't get on, you know, they weren't giving um, Dick Donner what he needed to make a better, better movie. Yeah. But um, they, yeah, they were, they were producers. They were, you know, looking after the money, mm. uh, which they had to, but uh, yeah, they, they, I mean, I didn't get much to do with Alex, but uh, um, Eli? Eli, yeah, 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 he was, uh, I got okay with him, he was fine, um, and Pierce Bengler, yeah. it was, uh, he was a nice man, so I got on well with them, so. I think it was Pierre and Dick Donner who had a problem with working with each other was more than say say Elia. So I think it, yeah. I think what it came down to was that Dick Donner said, "Well, I'll do Superman two if you get rid of Pierre." And obviously yeah. Elia worked with him and, and a testimony to friendship. He said, "Sorry, you've got to. I I can't drop him. Mm. We're going to have to replace you as director." Which I suppose you can see his. You know, it's yeah, yeah, it's loyalty, but uh, it's you know, uh, the, the actors weren't happy that uh, they were getting you, you know, he was leaving. Mm. 
So would you say that Richard Lester was a more producer's director rather than Dick Absolutely, Donald? yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with Richard and uh, he's several times and uh, he's brought films in under budget and under time. I mean, he's, he's a, a dream a director for a producer. Hmm. He'd have three cameras on two people talking, one with a, a wide angle, one with a close up of that guy and one close up of that guy. And that would be it. You, you shot the scene. Hmm. So you move on, you know, he's... Uh, he is a brilliant at that sort of thing. Mm. He comes from television. He was Canadian and he came from television mm. as a television producer and director. So, so he never has cut, cut, cut corners. Mm. So you, yeah, you're used to turning things around quicker, aren't you, obviously, on TV? Yeah. And, yeah. Well, I think Richard Donner started on things like Mount and Uncle and things like that as well, so. Mm. No, I think no matter what people think of Superman 3, they always love this, this, this part of the film. Mm. And we had, I did a storyboard for all of it and the, the assistant director said, you better get this right. And uh, I went home, I had a terrible weekend trying to work out how we were going to do this with the stunt guys and, and Superman. Mm. Um, eventually, I got it all, it was right. And uh, I knew exactly when we were going to change costumes and things like that, because it had to be, you know, it had to be storyboarded in such a way that we could use both of them with the stunt guy. Um, so I'd, I'd, um, I'd use a couple of stunt guys uh, when we first, uh, parts of this, um, I had uh, Richard Hammett, um, who was going to be thrown off the top into the crusher. Mm. Uh, and I had a, um, a Russian swing on the top of the containers at the side, at the top. Mm. Um, and he went up, we did a few rehearsals, he, he did perfectly. And then one, he went up and came straight down on, and uh, injured himself. That was Pat Roach um, when Richard had uh, hurt himself. I got Pat Roach in because he was the right size, but he was yeah. uh, a little wooden. He was, he was too big. Mm. So then I had to stand in do it myself. I imagine Chris really enjoyed playing the evil part. Besides yeah, him. yeah. He loved the villains. <laughs> he loved to be, you know, having it different. I think that was me going backwards into the into the water. Mm. And we had Richard at one point, Richard Hammett, mm. which is a double, actually. It's a shame he injured himself. And obviously on modern films you'd have um the actor with dots all over his face and you do photos. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you couldn't do any tricks like that. Mm. To have any differences, could you? Yeah. Just as makeup, hairstyles and glasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is what you're talking about, using the swing. Yeah. So this is, was me and him, they superimposed us on each other. And that's me going through the air, yeah. the, the crusher. It was 36 feet I had to fly to get into uh, onto the airbag that was by the crusher. Right. It was 25 feet high. Do you know a Russian swing? It's like you... Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that was some forwards and then you get somebody behind it really swings it higher and at that point is where you go forward and out hmm. you go up you'll come straight back down yeah. so you've got a time exactly right hmm. and richard slipped and uh, he came off at the wrong time yeah. he was very good as a double how about the complexity of having chris chris in, 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 in yeah the it was a yeah but it was all rubber um and i tried it out first and uh it was it was safe enough it was just uncomfortable yeah but, um, but he was fine with it mm. 
Yeah, great courage, Chris. He was a very nice, nice man to work with. If he didn't fancy something, he'd tell you. You've got to rely, you know, on the special effects, <laughs> do it, getting that right. Because it's all hydraulics. Hmm. So, so Jim missed. Um, you said obviously it's who? Who did you say it was the, the guy did who did the swing but didn't? Um, uh, Richard Hammett. Richard Hammett. Um, yeah, just so Jim didn't hear his, his name the first time. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but that apart was, from that, it was always you and you and Chris. Yeah. With the tires going over again, I, I imagine that was that was quite lightweight and. Uh, yes, yeah. But then I still had to have them dropped on my head hmm. just to make sure that, you know, um, it was it was OK. So um, that was, you know, obviously cuts in between. But um, I remember the tyres going over my head and making sure because they were just dropping on top of me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I didn't want one of those to say because they were... They were quite heavy. Because this is you, that you your foot, isn't it? Kicking, um... Yeah. So we, that was me kicking him, and then that was a great photograph. Who got that for me? Oh, it's a, a, a guy called Alex, um, Alex Surfer. He, he found that. So, and yeah. uh, I should mention Alex because he also designed the poster. Oh, the right. Poster. Well done, Alex. I did our previous one. So I, 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 I can't thank Alex enough really for his all his help. He's um, been very supportive at these events. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good kick, I think. You know, it, um, it's all all shot very well, I think. Hmm. So you wouldn't have. Um, Doubling people in the old days, you wouldn't have like a, a mask of somebody or looked that looked a bit. No, we didn't. Uh, we, prosthetics or anything like that. No, I mean they were just starting to come in then. I mean I did it on um, on I uh, I had a rubber mask. It was my face, mind you. Um, on um, uh, so, uh, on um, Bond. Uh, license to kill when I double for Land uh, uh, Sanchez at the end. Mm -hmm. I had um, a rubber, my rubber mask on because of the flat flame, really, the, the heat. But that would have been Chris and I changing over at different times. But it was, I mean, for those days, it was good that they could do that sort of stuff. Hmm. It's early days of um, um, editing and uh, hmm. doing doubling stuff like that. Did Chris cut himself during the scenes? He always seems to have a little bit of unwet dirt on his face. Just mud. We, we were no, rolling around the mud. Yeah, because when he got the car pressure, he seemed to have a little mark there. I was wondering whether it was. Oh, really? Yeah, no, I didn't, uh, I hadn't noticed. Yeah, we just did it We did so much on pole arms in the early days, mm. which is a pole that sticks out the center of the, of the screen and it, you just pro project the whatever scene you are in, but you're, you're 15 feet up uh, and up. <laughs> Sticking on the end of a pole, and you had a uh, we had body molds, we had a, a, like a, um, a four inch pipe, solid a bar. It wasn't a pipe; it was a solid bar coming out the back of a screen. Um, and then on the end of that, you had a body mold, and you laid on it. Um, and then they put a costume over the top of that, so they could shoot from certain angles without seeing the pole behind you. And then it was on a gimbal, and then you could fly move backwards and forwards. So we had different body moulds for different angles. If you're going flying sideways, the camera would be on your side and the pole would be behind you. And then if you're flying forward, it, the pole would be behind you. So yeah, it was all um, all really worked out. I mean, yet we were inventing it as we were going along. <laughs> yeah. 
I suppose that's a testimony to Christopher Reeve being very fearless because it wasn't like people were doing the, this for years. This was no. experimental no. stuff and he's 40, 50 feet in the air. In the no. So is this actually at the Grand Canyon? Was this with this being? No, no, that was on the back lot. Oh, very, very clever. Um, part of it was, I remember them being on the back lot. They don't look real to me. I think that's probably on the... Hmm. I don't know where that would have been. It certainly wasn't um, in the Grand Canyon. Hmm. That would, would have been with the doubles, but not, hmm. um, not the actors. I mean, it looks very close, but, but yeah, if you look closer, you can see it and think it's a bit different. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, Jim just wanted to um, compliment you on the work on the jump yard sequence. He called it the same. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers. I mean, going back to just sort of talking about budgets, I mean, the money you kind of had to play with, would, was it about the same for one and two when they got to number three, or was it? I uh, yeah, yeah so, I mean, it's all, you know, pro rata of the uh, action you have to, to come up with. Um, you know, you, you do a breakdown and you say, yes, you know, I need. 15 stuntmen here and 12 there or three doubles here and then you work out your costs and then you um, say the equipment that you need, the crash pads, the, the um, time you need to rehearse all comes into it and you come up with a budget and you put that to them and they may say no well can you cut down on that or you know do you really need you know um, and you talk to the director and say, look, this is what's in the script. Do you want it? Um, you don't. If he says, yeah, I want it, then you go back to the producer and say, no, he's <laughs> the director wants it and it's in. Yeah. Um, and then it's up to the director to have the, the argument with the producer. Mm. Yeah. It. So, yeah, it usually works out. I uh, remember the stuff I've done with uh, 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 De Laurentiis. Um, we we would have arguments between departments and say, you know, say the wall's got to be flexible, it's got to be rubber. And the art department say to me, um, well, that comes out of your budget. I say, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a build, it's not mine. So we'd go to Raphael uh, De Laurentiis and say, look, he says it's on his budget and uh, I say it's on uh, my budget or whatever. And, we'd, uh, and she'd say, hold on, it all comes out of the same budget. Just get it done. <laughs> so we were about arguing, trying to get keep our budget small, and uh, she would say, "Just get it done." Because <laughs> the computer set is in, I think, it's the 007 stage, isn't it? This, the computer set, the uh, with the big computer set. Yeah, the layer here, yeah. Is that 007 stage? Yes. Yeah. Um, there was a crossover, wasn't there, with? This film and Octopussy, the um, the James Bond film, wasn't there? Yes, yeah, probably, yeah. I, I don't remember. I think there's a picture of um, of Roger Moore in, in his clown outfit, and I think it's a picture of Christopher Reeve. They're both together. Yeah. Um, so it must because you were on obviously on Octopussy as well. Yeah. So you'd obviously did you finish Superman by this. Or you yeah, I would thought back? so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they would have gone to to. Uh, on Octopussy, yeah, well, they were probably in India, mm. to India to do some stuff, and uh, I was probably still on this. So when they came back to the studio, then you would have probably come, because then they might have been doing all the uh, process work and optics stuff and everything, mm. and you were on Octopussy. Yeah. Because that stunt on Octopussy has to be one of the dangerous, most dangerous ones you've, you've done, I think, when you catch yes, up. Yeah, yeah. Running on top of the train and ducking under the bridges was the dangerous, most dangerous. I left it too late, you know, a so, second. So close, isn't it? I, I've rewatched really that recently and it's like, wow, you know. So. Yeah. yeah. And I did it three times. I was, you know, on the second unit. So I'm saying, 
we can do this closer, we can do this closer. And then I just got out and thought, oh God, tip it. And I just got underneath it. We just take them, uh, I wouldn't be here. But uh, would half the things you did back then be allowed now because of? No, no, you wouldn't get, wouldn't get away with it. They'd say, you know, there'd be a reason why you couldn't do it. You'd have to do it on wires or you'd have to do it, you know, um, so that um, no one was taking the responsibility, they wouldn't take the responsibility. So you have to make double sure that um, nothing's going to happen because you have, you have to do um, your health and safety um, forms before you start. You have to say that. I've had Warner Brothers on um, uh, uh, awful, um, uh, Three Musketeers. And before we started, the, the Warner Brothers insurance people came to me and they said, look, we won't, won't put money into this film. We won't back it unless you tell me that you can do all this action safely. And um, so you have to, yeah, you go through it and you say, no, this would be quite safe. You know, it sounds bad, uh, you know, going under um, uh, a wagon or falling off this or doing that. And uh, they weren't too sure. So I had to convince them that it would be okay. Mm. And, uh, but that's how, you know, health and safety conscious they were becoming in those days. Yeah. So I don't think they would allow the guy who played Superman, you know, to, to be 50 feet in the air on, on wires, you know, these days. Well, it's only be on thicker wires and you can do it now because the wires are so thick. You, you know, you couldn't commit suicide if you wanted to. You couldn't get off it. Because I assume for more longer shots or, or where Chris B was higher, the wires would be a, a bit a bit more sturdy or would it be the same? Well, we went on to, well, we still didn't know in those days. I mean, we certainly came away from the um, just 18 gauge, just a, a piano chord. We were onto Bowden Cable at that time, although they still break, but um, we were naive enough to think that uh, they wouldn't break. Hmm. I mean, obviously, if, you know, being 40 feet up in the air, I mean, obviously there'd be boxes and things, you know, so there was protection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you always put uh, something underneath you, if it, you know, just when you can, you know. If you don't see the floor, then you, you cover it. Hmm. Make sure that uh, if anything went wrong, you'd, you'd be covered. It's like when we had him at the end of the film uh, on the location, um, we couldn't get boxes on the floor. We hmm. did a rehearsal to make sure that uh, everything would be working. But when uh, him and uh, Chris and uh, Richard land, you know, they had to come down onto the ground. So we couldn't have any uh, safety there. No, no. I think this is quite interesting in in the bubble and how we sort of did. I don't know if you remember working with this particular part of the film. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful set, um, and uh, you know, you just had to visualise what was going to happen. You know, obviously, <laughs> it didn't really work a great. It didn't look fantastic, but um, we knew what we we was having to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. So it's where you put the wires in there and what you can do within the wire situation. Hmm. Uh, and then a lot of, um, see that CGI stuff there, it's, um, you can get it away with, but uh, any close up, it was, um, it was difficult. Hmm. It was funny. Um, when she's screaming, help me, help me. Um, and he was out, he was laying on the floor and he couldn't help her. Um, I, I got into a Batman outfit, outfit and came running on the set and, uh, and we was in hysterics. It, I've got a photo here. Can you see that photo up there? Oh yes, I see that, yeah, yeah. That's- uh, yeah, And Ross, yeah, and Ross, yeah. Me dressed as Batman with, um, um, Annie Ross laughing yeah. head off. That's lovely, yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh, we had a bit of laugh on the, on the set occasionally when he could get away with it. This is Greg Elam doing the swing for Richard. Was Richard quite funny on on set? Yeah, yeah, he was. He was good fun.
He'd always find a joke, something funny. And Chris and Richard got on well, did they? Yes, yeah. They were, they seemed to be fine. I mean, uh, as I say, the uh, last sequence when I had to get him up into, uh, to be carried uh, 50 feet in the air, we, um, we put him into his harness uh, with the underwear so to, to make sure that nothing was rubbing on him. Mm. Uh, and I took him into the studio on his own um, and with Bob Harmon and we put the harness on him and just took him off a foot into the air so that he could uh, get used to it. He, he winced a bit when it was uh, under his crutch, but um, we padded him out um, and we got him, I got him about six feet off the ground. And then I brought in, um, because we had him on two separate wires, we then brought in Chris um, who um, uh, put his arm around him and we had to measure it so that they were both comfortable uh, and one wasn't, you know, pulling down on, on the other one. So we got the wires, we rehearsed, got the wires right. And then I started taking him up 15 feet up into the air. And he was, oh, God, please, God, help me. Oh, God, I hate this. So, yeah, he was, uh, he was complaining about, you know, he hated heights. Hmm. It was a, a bit uh, late to tell me. <laughs> we then got to get him out on location. Um, 50 feet in the air. Hmm. So yeah, he was, uh, but uh, he was a good guy. I liked him. This was a, a nice set, but I had to, I had a stunt double for Annie when she um, starts becoming part of the, um, the, the machine. Hmm. And we had to start sticking stuff to her face, you know, and gradually take her back into the machine. Yeah. It's, uh, <clears throat> and he was very good too, so, but I had a good double for her. Do you remember who the double was? Uh, Sue Crossland. I had her also doubling for um, Lois at one time. Oh, right. yeah. No, Lois and um, uh, what was the name? Hel um, Irma uh, and in one and two. Um, oh, Ursa. The, Ursa. Uh, Ursa, yes. yeah. I had a doubling for her at one time. And I also had a doubling for um, Sigourney Weaver on Aliens, but Sigourney's like six feet tall and uh, poor Sue is only about five foot eight. So <laughs> it was, uh, we had to make sure that they looked right, hmm. which we got away with, so it was fine. See, this was Richard. I mean, to, that was his double, but we had to get Richard to start with that. Mm. But uh, Greg was a good double for him. Yeah. This is interesting to watch. I haven't just seen it, you know. I mean, I ran through it the other day, just. Uh, fast forward it just see if there was anything I might have missed but um, it's interesting to see it after you know I, I can't remember the last time I saw it in fall. Do you find it better than you remembered it or do you how, how do you feel? Yeah, about yeah it? no it's good I, you know, I mean it's um, it's yeah it's um, as good as I thought it, it would have been yeah I mean it's it's uh, it holds up in, in its way. It's a Dick Lester version of, um, of Superman. And um, once you accept that, I think you're, um, that's Sue Crossland. Mm. <laughs> and then we had to, once we got her up against the wall, we had to tie her into it. So that she was uh, stuck in there from behind.
I've forgotten that he'd gone back to gab the, uh, uh, the acid, hadn't he? It's a good little setup, isn't it? From, um... Yes, from earlier. I don't know if studios these days would trust audiences to remember that far back. I don't know if there's yeah. more of a trust of education of, of, of movie goers back then than there is now, perhaps. Yeah. So obviously this is a wire, just wire work, sort of push pulling your back sort of thing. Yes, yeah. I take all of this mostly miniatures, I'm guessing, or was it? No, that was, um, I mean, it's only it's stop frame, really. It's they put a piece across, put another piece across, and uh, and then enhance that. Hmm. It was, um, I remember when that blew up, it was quite a uh, quite an explosion hmm. to be in there because it was a covered set I mean it was in, in the state in the stage so it's quite noisy yeah, yeah. all that's miniature but uh, this was uh, quite noisy inside I can't remember where I'd dub him for probably. Oh, I think it was uh, uh, Wendy Leach. Oh, yes. Um, you know. Right? Yeah. So how is Christopher's relationship with, with Richard Lester as a director versus, say, Richard Donner? Did they work well together? Uh, yeah, I think Chris was um, was doing the best he could with mm. Richard Lester. Um, obviously, after working with, should be working with, um, with Richard Donner, mm. uh, who he got on very well with, um, yeah. and uh, for for Richard Lester to have to come in under that sort of cloud uh, wasn't easy for Richard Lester and it certainly wasn't easy for the actors they had to accept that Donna was gone and no one could do anything about it so they had to deal with the situation as it was and that was with uh, Richard Lester who mm. was always amicable with everybody um, they may not have liked the way this is where we had him up this is in on in the studio on a pole arm, so that um, they were on a pole arm and extension down onto to Richard. Yeah, that's in the studio. But then this last little bit, um, we had him flying in, and uh, as they were coming in, Richard said to me, "Can I shut my eyes before we go up there?" And so I said, "Yeah, but you've got to open your eyes when you come to land." Hmm. And he said, all right, so up he goes. And <laughs> they were coming into land and he wouldn't open his eyes. He, so when they first landed, they stumbled. Hmm. Um, and I said, look, Richard, you've got to open your eyes. You, Rich, uh, Chris will tell you the last little bit, bit when you come down, open your eyes hmm. and then you'll be, you'll be okay. And yes. it did, and we, we got the shot. I said, if you don't, we're going to have to do it again and again until you get it right. So he then took me aside, Richard, afterwards. He took me to one side. He said, he said, you know, when I was up there, he said, 100 feet in the air, 
He said, I was scared. He said, I was saying to God, please, God, look after me. He said, and, and Chris was saying to me, you're all right, Richard. You're okay. I've got you, Richard. You're safe. I've got you. And, he, and Richard said to me, he said, and you know, I believe that he believed it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. But uh, a lovely guy. Such a shame when he went so early. Yeah. And that's Larry Lamb, is the uh, other, uh, and the guy on the right is uh, Larry Lamb, who's uh, become a, you know, a big TV star here, and uh, Gavin and Stacey and all those. Hmm. He, he was the, um, he was born in the same town as I was, in Edmonton. Oh, right. I think he was also in Superman, the movie, I think, as a, as a journalist in the Day Planet. Yeah, probably, yeah. It's like Shane, Shane Wimmer appearing in Superman 2 and yes. that's nice at all. Shane Wimmer was the token American in everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so did you get the impression that this was Chris, going to be Chris Reeve's last film of the Soul Kinds? You think that he was step, stepping away? From I, yeah, I didn't think they would do another one. Mm. But um, but he wouldn't, obviously he wasn't going to do it unless he was in more control uh, than he had on this one. Um, so he, he then took over, didn't he really? I mean, it was his story and uh, he had more power. He had a lot of power on this, on the, on the flying unit. Hmm. He'd come on the flying unit and um, uh, he would say what he wanted. He was directing this, you know, hmm. the action on the flying unit. But we had time to when we were had fun, especially on two. I think was uh, we had uh, Andre de Toff, uh, who was a second unit director, who was a guy in his seventies then, um, and had short cropped hair, had a patch, he had one eye, had a patch over one eye, and we used to call him Scrub Nut. Very short cropped hair, American, French American, I don't know, um, but um, he'd done some good films in his time, and. <clears throat> <laughs> when Chris was, yeah, it was when Chris was doing the fight, flying very fast, chasing the um, uh, sat the, um, the the bombs, the, oh, the missile. missiles, yeah. yeah, and he's doing like two uh, two thousand miles an hour chasing these things, and we're close on him uh, with a back uh, with a uh, back projection, and he's flying towards us. So he's on the pole arm, and he's there like, and it's doing that. I got up in the rafters and I found in the prop store an old uh, albatross, a white albatross. And it was like arms out there, head to one side. So I put a patch over one eye and he had like a scrub nut. And it looked just like Andre to top. So as he was flying, um, I slowly let it down on wire. So it was alongside uh, Chris. And Chris was like really acting like that. And he went, <laughs> Come sideways, he saw this thing alongside him. But yeah, we used to have a bit of fun. Mm. That was Gareth, uh, um, his little bit diving onto the trolley. He did that himself. Mm. So she's back with the new teeth. Yeah. You get a sense of almost setting up if they did a four, but they would have been the more of a sort of um yeah. between Lois and, and Lana, which I think would have been really, really good. Uh, I've never seen four, so it wasn't a time. I mean, they're, they're not, they're, they're, she's, they're, they didn't pursue that in the end, but uh, yeah. if, they, if the Soul Kinds had made a fourth, then that Lana Lois thing, I think, would have been yeah. quite new to explore, but unfortunately they didn't. No. Do you have any other specific memories of, of Superman 3 that you'd like to mention that we haven't already touched on? Um, 
Not really. I think we've done, gone through most of it. Mm. Um, see, we had a, a cape. I don't know if you, you've had this before, but the cape we used to use um, when we when we couldn't use uh, wind underneath it was a, a little bite metal thing you had on your back and it mm. vibrated the cape. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, lucky enough, when I had my accident, I didn't have that on because if I'd have had that metal on my back, uh, I think I would have been um, a lot worse than just breaking my cheekbone. Mm. So um, yeah, normally uh, you have two fans either side when you're flying, or yeah. if you're flying on wires in the studio, you have fans at the side blowing the, the cape. Mm. So they have to get it just right so that you, you've got a flutter and it's not like going all over the place. Mm. Lucky shot that. Yeah. Obviously, if there are any names that are coming up here that, that, that you want to talk about, please feel free to, to do so. Um, yeah, I'll have a look. Yeah, Bob Painter. I mean, he was, he was a great photographer and he did uh, Thriller as well with Michael Jackson and, okay. uh, and Landis. Um, Colin was obviously the, the Vesselbeck supervisor. Warfield was a genius of optical. He did all that optical stuff. David Lane was... Um, a great guy and he did a lot of the puppet uh, puppet things with um um silver anderson oh, yeah. um, uh, so zoron was the, the great he came up with the zoron optic thing where when we were first starting we, you you took the camera past superman mm. into the background which didn't work so what you had to do what zoron came up with that he could make the background go out, go small as you went forward. So he looked like Superman was flying by you. And that was what made a man fly. The key yeah, it was brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, a great, all that crew, mm. great uh, from the accountants and uh, makeup, Paul Ingram. Yes. Uh, yeah. But yeah, oh, Paul Weston, Sam Cordana. Was he on that? Yeah. Yeah, some great, you yeah, know, Mark Wolf, a brilliant helicopter pilot, has been for, uh, again, 40 years. That man, Terry Acton Snow, who's the art director, I think he's yes, on, yeah. on as well together. He's brilliant. He's still there. He's still teaching um, uh, art uh, for, at Pinewood, uh, art direction. He's a lovely guy. Shane Rimmer. See all the uh, Moody Yanks. Mm. Robert Beatty, been around for years. Laurent Lamb. See, that's all my stunt guys. So, oh, so sorry? Uh, so Tracy Eden, would she have done stuff with Pamela Stevenson? Yeah, she was the one in the beginning. Uh, I used her out there all the time. Um, but she was the one on roller skates that hit the uh, uh, telephone boxes and knocked them all over. Oh, right, yeah. So she was out there with us. So, yeah, used her a lot. She was, she was brilliant. And her daughters now are fantastic stunts. So, yeah, and she, Wayne Michaels is a... Um, her husband. Oh, he did the um, jump off the town yeah. in Goldeneye, didn't he? Yeah. Um, and he also did the, the fall off the train on Octopussy with me. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I, he, he had great courage. Yeah, he's back to the boxes. We're doing 30 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to him, OK, when I say go, go. And I mm -hmm. just pushed him off. And um, he couldn't see any boxes when he went. So he's going backwards. I'm going forwards. I can see the boxes. So he was uh, a great trust in me to, to drop him into the boxes. So we were both safe. Yeah, so well, that was nice to see. I'm glad you uh, invited yeah. me. That was uh, nice. Thank you. Had a wonderful time. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you
time. Uh, I did have a just read a nice comment that uh, uh, I think yeah, Jim I think I think said. Uh, I just want to say we're so grateful for, for you, Paul. Thanks for being so professional, uh, innovative, and friendly. Your contributions, talent, and passion helped make uh, uh, help make your youth so magical. And for what we will always be thankful uh, to you for. Oh, it's a pleasure. No, thank you very much. Very kind of you to say so. Do you have a favourite stunt from, from from your time on Superman? The the, the the three films that you did. Uh, final uh, no, uh, which I was going to tell you. Um, it's when we were trying to make a man fly. Mm. We tried everything. I had in my wardrobe in my dressing room. I blacked it out with black velvet. Mm. Uh, I had a model Superman hanging on wires. And I got a, a video camera and a projection camera, and I was projecting the uh, New York skyline onto a 50 50 mirror. Hmm. Now, I don't know if you understand the technology of it, a 50 50 mirror, you look through the mirror, which is at a 45 degree angle to you. Yeah. Uh, and then you put black on one side, and it looks like, and when you project the mirror uh, onto the mirror, it sends a beam of light down onto your screen hmm. so that the camera can look right down the beam because it, when you're doing front projection the light if um say chris reeves is in foreground the light hits him the beam of the film hits him but it goes out of that angle so you hmm. get a fuzzy bit you can't go around the back of his body hmm. so you imagine it's a shadow at the side of him so we were trying everything to 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 do that to lose the wires, and it sort of worked, but it only worked for night shots. It didn't work for the day shots. Um, so we were there one day when it was on Superman one, and I was doing the flying unit, and Dick Donner was directing, and Leslie Les uh, B uh, Bowden Leslie, yeah Les. Bowie, Les Bowie, the, the uh, special effects guy, came in one day and he said, I cracked it. We said, what? He said, get Richard here. I'm going to want a meeting. So we had a meeting and he said, look, if you take a stick and you wave it in front of your eyes, fast enough, it disappears. Mm. If we can vibrate the wires fast enough, they would disappear. Dick Donner said, yeah, great, try it. So the next, that, uh, next day we, we set it all up. Uh, I was about six feet off the ground. We put um, a, a white board behind so that we could see the wires clearly from the camera head on. Um, and he got two enormous vibrators and he put two ladders up the side, either side of the, the uh, wires. I'm hanging on two wires, ready to, to do my flying. They went up there, taped these two vibrators to the wires. So I've got my harness on under my crutch. I'm ready to go. Um, they say, okay, roll cameras. They switch the vibrators on, came down off the ladders, cleared the ladders. And then the next morning we went to see it in rushes to see whether it worked. So Dick Donner, the producers, everyone was there to see whether this would actually work. So there you are, turnover, action. You see me laying there like that. And then you see, because there's no sound, then you see my face change like that. And what was happening, the vibrators were doing the wires. It was going right down onto my harness, right under my crutch. I was like, oh, cool. I said, I don't care if it doesn't work, I want one. <laughs> but the problem was, it was like a sound wave. It went thick at one end and then it went disappeared in the middle and it went thick again and it disappeared again. So you had two bits that disappeared, but the middle bit was quite thick hmm. and it disappeared again and it went thick again at my the waist. So a lovely idea, but it didn't work. <laughs> no, good, good idea, yeah. Um... Do you have any final comments you would like to make about Superman 3 now that you've seen it again after all these years? No, I'm, I'm glad that people still enjoy it. Um, and uh, it was a great effort for, from the crew uh, and the um, uh, and director was, you know, did the best he could with what he had and what he wanted to do. 
Um, I, I'm happy with the stunts. I think they all sort of worked uh, and was happy to work with the special effects to achieve them because a lot of time we have to work together. Uh, and the Wyoming, Bob, uh, Bob Harmon and his team. Um, I think, yeah, overall, um, yeah, I, I was pleased with the movie at the time. It did very well. Um, and uh, it was a great credit uh, to, to, for me to put on my, my CV and, uh, you know, to be able to, to say that I've done, you know, Superman 1, 2 and 3, um, I, I was quite proud of. Yeah, so, uh, and thanks for all you, you guys who, uh, you know, still want to see it and, um, and are interested in how we, we made a man fly. And then it's, and it's nice that, you know, 3 has been a bit neglected in the past, but it is enjoying a bit of a resurgence as well. Which is yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. It's good entertainment. It's what, you know, we grew up on uh, as kids, you know, with the old cartoons uh, and then the, the first, you know, uh, physical series of it. Um, but yeah, it was nice. To, it was great to have, to have the opportunity to work on them. Okay, absolutely. Um, before I let you go, Paul, I have to ask you uh, something, and you have told me this story before, but I thought it was a lovely story, I think, that might, that, that might end us quite nicely. Um, you worked on a, a Countess from Hong Kong with Chai Chaplin. I just wondered mm -hmm. if you wanted to, to recount your, 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 um, your experiences with, with, with the legend that was Chai, Chai Chaplin. Yes, I was, um, I was an extra, really, on the, on the movie. We were doing the sequence. The story is that uh, Marlon Brando and Sophie Loren meet on board uh, Queen Mary, the old Queen Mary, and they fall in love on, on board uh, and they're on, in the ballroom, uh, they're dancing. And I was one of, the, I had a partner and we were about, I suppose, 25, 30 couples dancing around um, Sophie and, uh, and Marlon. Uh, the great man was directing um, and we were waltzing around, um, minding our business with the music was going and Marlon and uh, Sophie were sort of cuddling in the middle. And in one rehearsal, the music was going and I was just about to come past the camera. Charlie Chaplin stepped out in front and said, stop. I thought, uh oh, he's watched me dance. I'm not the greatest waltzer in the world. I'm going to get sacked. And he said, he said, come here. And we went to him and he put his arm around both of us. He said, dance with me. And off we went and we danced and he guided us around up Marlon, um, Marlon and Sophie, and we went round in a circle and he was really light on his feet. He was 77 at the time, I think. And we danced around and uh, we came, as we came past camera again, he said, and when you get to here, I'm gonna bring the camera in past you. Is that okay? I said, yes, sir, yes, yes. This was Charlie Chaplin. I was dancing with Charlie Chaplin. But yeah, he was, uh, he was a gentleman and a lovely man. Although the, the, the movie wasn't as happy as it should have been, uh, it was his only movie he ever worked on that he didn't put his own money in. Uh, it was the only, the first movie he did in colour and it was his last movie. Um, Marlon didn't get on with Charlie because uh, Charlie had written a script some years before, so he knew every line in it and he would tell Marlon how to say the words, which Marlon didn't like at all. And then Marlon and Sophie, did, oh, she was stunning. She was absolutely beautiful. Uh, she, he didn't get on with, she didn't get on with Marlon because he, apparently in one of their love scenes, she's laying back there and he's looking down at her and he said to her, you know, you've got black hairs up your nose. <laughs> <laughs> apparently it didn't go down very well. But um, yeah, they, um, it was a, a, quite an experience to be in presence of the, of the great man who would, as a kid, I mean, uh, you, you just worshipped him. Oh, uh, his is. talent, yeah. And still do. There's nothing no one quite, quite, quite like him. Um, so I know that Marlon Brando was famous for not learning his lines. Oh, he did. Superman one, you know. That must have drove Chaplin crazy if it's his script and he wasn't. Yes. Yeah. I don't know how he got on with that, but on Superman one, he was. He came in, did learn learn a line, and we had the idiot boards all around the baby when he's putting the baby in the, the cradle. I was the um, the guard. Um, that tells them the the uh, committee that uh, uh, the villains have broken out, uh, yeah, or, or trying to um, 
uh, take over. Uh, so I was standing there in the in the silver suit with a big helmet on and uh, at the, at the bar across here, um, so I could see out of. And then the laser had to go up and down my body. Hmm. Well, in those days, no one knew what the laser was or how bad it was to, if it went into your eyes. So they actually put gaffer tape on the inside so that the light wouldn't get into my eyes. So we shot that scene with me not being able to see where I was. <laughs> but yeah, so, I mean, um, but all the all the Supermans have been, you know, quite mon monumental in their own way. You know, people, have, you know, kids have hooked onto them. Like I get hooked onto uh, Superman when it was a TV series. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think people still enjoy that Superman image as all the superheroes now have taken over the cinemas, really, haven't they? I mean, all the superheroes. They have done. I mean, if, if they were quite unique, but back, you know, the Superman, the, the first big sort of superhero blockbuster. Yeah. yeah. Was, so it must have been something huge at the time to for to have seen. But now, of course, you've got a movie every six weeks almost yeah. similar to it. So they were very much the forerunners, weren't they, of, of modern cinema? Yeah, yeah. Well, I do appreciate all you guys still uh, still enjoying it, and um, I hope I've come up with some ideas. I mean, some of the memories that uh, I remembered uh, for you uh, on that movie. Well, I, I think everybody, Paul, that we've all had a really well a magical evening of just being in, in your presence is, is enough anyway. But for you to share all the wonderful stories about Superman and obviously the other um, wonderful highlights of your career as well. And rounding off that lovely Chai Chaplin story, I don't think it comes be any better than dancing with Chai mm. Chaplin. So, um, that's, um, so thank, thank you very much for, for joining us. I'm sure everybody it's will be in the uh, Thank you, thank you for, for spending so much time with us tonight. A, be a better way to spend a Friday night, I, I can't think think of what that would be. <laughs> well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, right. so. well, thank, thank you much for joining us. T t take good care of yourself. I will, indeed. We look forward to your book when that comes out. And, yes, uh, yeah. I'll let you know when it's uh, when it's coming out. Yeah, we will. We look forward to that. So, um, and um, hopefully we'll we'll see you at events um, when everything gets back to back to normal. Wouldn't um, that be nice? Everyone's saying lots of lots of thank yous uh, to you, Paul, and if I should read out um, uh, from Lee. Thank you, Paul, for sharing your stories and helping to make a man fly and capturing our, our imaginations again and again for all these years. Um, thank thank you, you for your time. This was very interesting. Uh, thanks, Bunch Paul. You have made you've made us smile. Um, I think it's safe to say people liked it. So. Thank you. That's very, very reassuring. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And um, hopefully we're going to do, do more of these of these events. Um, not quite sure yet, but I hope there'll be more, more coming. I hope this this will also go on YouTube as well, so people who couldn't join us will be able to see it as, as well. So um, thank you everybody for joining us. My, my special thank you to, to Paul for giving his, 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 his time this evening. And uh, until next time, we'll um, say goodbye for now. Thanks, guys. Been a pleasure. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Paul.